Hello, everyone, and welcome to Uncivil Law, where, as always, we learn through the misfortunes of others. I am your host, Uncivil Law, a licensed attorney in Texas, Virginia, and before the U.S. Supreme Court, and I hope you have a great day. For today's case, we start our coverage of one of the Crumbly trials. This is the mother of Ethan Crumbly. Ethan Crumbly is a convicted school shooter, went into a school with a handgun and shot up some people. He has been convicted, currently appealing his life sentence. But we're trying to charge the mother with involuntary manslaughter, and also the father for that matter, who are being charged and tried in separate trials. So this is the charge of the mother. So this is the beginning of the trial. It's currently scheduled to last for three weeks, so we were going to go ahead and get started with that. We're about 20 minutes behind in real time. We're just going to listen in. We're just going to listen at 1x, so we'll just be 20 minutes behind, behind live, but that's okay. We'll catch up at a break. So we begin with the beginning of the opening statement. So the prosecutor is about to give their opening statement, and, and we'll start from there. Good morning, everybody. I want to introduce you to Anna St. Juliana, Madison Baldwin, Tate Muir, and Justin Schilling. They died on November the 30th of 2021. They weren't in a car crash. They weren't sick. They were murdered in an act of terror committed by Jennifer Crumbly's 15 year old son. Jennifer Crumbly didn't pull the trigger that day, but she is responsible for those deaths. Good start. These kids were gunned down inside Oxford High School with this gun. It's a six hour, nine millimeter handgun purchased four days before the shooting by James Crumbly, Jennifer's husband and father of the school shooter. This was a purchase celebrated by Jennifer on Instagram. These are her words, this is her post. Mom and son day testing out his new Christmas present. My first time shooting a nine millimeter, I hit the bullseye. Good start. The evidence will prove that by the time this gun was bought, the school shooter was in a downward spiral that had begun months before. The evidence will also show you that Jennifer Crumbly was aware of that. Despite her knowledge of his deteriorating mental crisis, despite her knowledge of his growing social isolation, despite the fact that it is illegal for a 15 year old to walk into a gun store and walk out with a handgun by himself, this gun was gifted. You will also learn that despite all of that background, this firearm was not secured in a way to prevent her son from gaining access to it. The evidence will also prove to you that even with all of that, on November the 30th, Jennifer Crumbly was still given the opportunity to prevent these murders from ever happening. Instead, she chose to do nothing. This drawing, this math worksheet, was sent to her November the 30th, 2021, at 9.30 in the morning. That's more than three hours before the first shot was fired. These writings, that drawing, created by her son. She was sent this by her son's school counselor when he requested an immediate meeting with her at the school that day. He requested that meeting because this drawing, those words, suggest both weapon and injury even to someone with only limited knowledge of the shooter. Apparently, that raised an alarm with Jennifer Crumbly because she did go to the meeting with her husband, but before she did, she privately communicated her own concern with her husband. This will be admitted in evidence throughout the trial. This is a portion of a Facebook messenger thread from Jennifer to James Crumbly. Jennifer words in blue. Emergency, November 30th, 2021, 9.35 a.m. Then she sent the picture to James. His response, my God, WTF. And then he wrote back about the vet. He was at their barn worried about their horse. Jennifer's response, he said he was distraught about last night. And then, I'm very concerned. 
headed to his school. It's at 10, 12 a.m. Yet despite their private concerns, the evidence presented in this trial will show to you that that meeting at the school was nothing like that school counselor or the dean of students who sat in at a meeting had ever experienced before. Hmm. Those two individuals, even with their limited knowledge of that drawing, had expected the defendant or her husband to take their son home and set an appointment with the mental health professional. But they didn't. You see, you will learn that these kind of meetings, when they occur with parents, can last an hour or longer. This one was abruptly ended by Jennifer Crumbly after just over 11 minutes. And then she left. <clears throat> you see, this drawing alarmed everyone who saw it, including those who only knew the Crumblies in limited settings, or even to those who had never met their son before. The two people in the world, with all of the information, all of the background, to put this drawing into context were James and Jennifer Crumbly. And you will learn that in that meeting, they didn't share any of it. They didn't say anything about the fact that that firearm was identical to the six hour nine millimeter, identical. They didn't mention how that gun was stored. They didn't mention anything about his increased mental distress. You'll learn that after the meeting when they left, they didn't embrace him. You'll learn that their home is just down the road from the Oxford High School. They didn't stop by the house to look for the gun. You'll learn never once did they ask their son, where's the gun? They did nothing. They didn't do any number of tragically small and easy things that would have prevented all of this from happening. Prosecutors killing it. One thing will prosecutors killing the opening. Just how senseless November 30th was. And that's because of all of the easy, ordinary things for someone to do that nobody did. What in this case? You will hear the facts and the evidence from the witnesses. You'll hear from between 20 and 25 of those witnesses. You're gonna see over 400 exhibits. You're gonna hear from witnesses who were in law enforcement. You're gonna hear from individuals who work for Oxford High School. You're gonna hear from people who knew Jennifer Crumbly in social situations and those who worked with Jennifer Crumbly. You're gonna hear from victims in this case as well those who were inside the school November the 30th. You're going to learn a little bit about the scope of the investigation. You'll learn that during this trial, the defendant's cell phone, her husband's cell phone, and their son's cell phone were seized. They were all forensically analyzed. Through all of that data received, in addition to data obtained through cell phone towers, social media search warrants, uh, through information received through banking rec records, GPS pings from gun ranges. All this information will be presented to you and you'll be able to obtain a digital footprint of the Crumbly family. And you'll get an idea, you get a view into the Crumbly life in the days, the weeks, the months preceding the shooting. You're also gonna learn a little bit about the aftermath of the shooting. Specifically, you're going to see a pattern emerge in Jennifer Crumbly after the shooting on November 30th. That pattern will include and show you that she immediately began to downplay and downright lie about her level of knowledge of her son and that weapon and that drawing on November the 30th. This pattern will continue up until the time that she and her husband are found hiding from the police in Detroit. This pattern will show you that her first instinct was to lie, her second was to run. Now, the evidence will show you that she didn't pull the trigger, but she's responsible. But there is no claim that she gifted that firearm to her son, knowing he was going to commit the attack. There's no claim that she wanted him to commit the attack. So how can she be held responsible when her son pulled the trigger? And the answer is, she's not charged with murder. She's charged with involuntary manslaughter. 
You see, murder is it's an intentional killing. Involuntary manslaughter, by definition, is unintentional. It's rooted in negligence. You've heard Judge Manthes tell you that every crime is made up of called, something called elements. This is no exception. You're going to learn that involuntary manslaughter is committed when someone's acts or their failures to act or their failures to perform their legal duty were grossly negligent, and that gross negligence was a cause of death. A cause of death, not the cause of death. Nice. It's very important. Because as you've heard, and you'll hear it again and again in this trial, that in a case such as this, when somebody else was a cause of death, the person who was grossly negligent can and still will be held responsible. That is, if the person who pulled the trigger, if the shooter in this case, his act was reasonably foreseeable to the defendant. To the defendant, specific to her, not to everybody else in the world, not to a stranger, not to a teacher, but to his mother, one of the two people in the world who raised him, who lived with him for 15 years, one of the two people in the world who had all the information necessary to put that drawing into context. So what's gross negligence? You will learn that it is a willful disregard of danger. Gross negligence is when you could use ordinary care, just ordinary care, to avoid a known danger, and you don't, even though it is apparent that serious injury could occur. And that's what this case is about. It's about- Do we really need the, like, five cops on the side of the thing? Do we really need that much? <laughs> that's why we're here. We're not here to talk about good parenting or bad parenting. It's not illegal to be a bad parent. We're not here to put restrictions on gun owners. That's not our job. That's not your job. That's for lawmakers. We're not here to talk about who else might be culpable or who else you think shares some blame. You will learn about the media on November the 30th. You may not like the fact that neither the school counselor nor the dean of students searched the school shooter's backpack. That's okay. That's okay. Because that does not mitigate Jennifer Crumley's culpability. You're going to learn a whole lot about James Crumbly and their son. But James, he's not on trial today. He has another trial in front of another jury. Their son, his case is over. He's already been charged and convicted and sentenced for terrorism causing death and first degree murder. Today is Jennifer's turn to stay in trial. And you will evaluate the evidence as it pertains to her and her only. We're here because when Jennifer looked at this drawing, she didn't look at it the way a stranger would. When she looked at this drawing, she looked at it knowing the context and the origin. And when someone with that kind of information looks at this, the unimaginable becomes predictable. It becomes reasonably foreseeable. That's why, even though she didn't pull the trigger on November the 30th, she's responsible for those deaths. I ask that during this trial, you listen to the testimony, you review the evidence, and you follow the law. If you do that, you will undoubtedly reach a fair and just verdict. If you do that, you will find this defendant guilty as charged. Thank you. I like the opening. It's a very, very good opening. Very solid. No major complaints. Very good. Thank you. Short, sweet, to the point, lays out the basics, doesn't overextend himself. Very nice. Oh, you can move it anywhere you want. There's a lot of stuff. Cord well, let's see what, see what the defense got. Sean, can you just help me? I'm going to pull it just forward. Watch this blue cord right here. And I'm going to keep it to the side because sure. I don't need it. Okay. I just have a few notes. On sure. Good. <clears throat> Prosecutor did a good job. Laid out the charge, laid out the basics, laid out why he, she might be responsible, laid out basic facts to that idea. Good job. Sorry, John. Just trying to get You're this. Good. Okay. Yeah. Sure. Go ahead.
On my way to court today, I blasted Taylor Swift to warm up my voice and calm my nerves. What? And there was a line in one of her songs that summarized what this case is about. Band-aids don't stop bullet holes. What? And that's what this case is about. It's about the prosecution attempting to put a Band-aid on problems that can't be fixed with a Band-aid. What are you talking about? The prosecution has charged Jennifer Crumbly with involuntary manslaughter in an effort to make the community feel better, in an effort to make people feel like someone is being held responsible, in an effort to send a message to gun owners, and none of those problems will be solved by charging Jennifer Crumbly with involuntary manslaughter. Uh, would you like it's to show what the evidence will show how you're going to win? Would you like to talk about that? And you give them a Band-Aid that they uh, put on that doesn't would, take Would you like to pain, talk about the witnesses you're going to call and the evidence you're going to present that shows that she's not responsible? Would you In like to case, preview your case at all? Will never bring back the lives that were lost by Hannah, Justin, Tate, and Madison Baldwin. Uh, and the evidence in this show, in this case, is is absolutely horrific. Much of the evidence is going to make you sick and disgusted and scare you, traumatize you. And quite frankly, there's no reason the evidence needs to be shown. Mrs. Crumbly, myself, Everyone in this courtroom agrees that on November 30th, 2021, the worst possible thing happened when Ethan Crumbly used a gun and terrorized the Oxford High School. So as you are watching the evidence, I ask you to keep in mind that much of what the prosecution is going to show you is going to alarm you and disgust you and be horrifically sad and tragic. But that evidence- Horrifically sad and tragic? About yeah. Ethan, I'm sorry, excuse me, about the shooter. And in this case, we have agreed to call Jennifer Crumbly's son the shooter because he is the shooter and he is the one, as you will see from the evidence, who was responsible for the tragedy that unfolded on November 30th of 2021. Prior to November 30th, Jennifer Crumbly was the mother to a 15-year-old son, and she did not have it on her radar in any way that there was any mental disturbance that her son would ever take a gun into a school, that her son would ever shoot people. The evidence at trial is going to show you that Jennifer Crumbly did the best she could as a mother to a child who grew up into a teenager and had no way to know what was going to happen. Yeah, this is the Jennifer this isn't the right Crumbly way to go about this, counselor. Raised a son that she took to soccer. Hey, practice, you want to you want to try again on this opening? Bowling. She's the kind of mother who went a mole on his back, changed color, a one millimeter mole. She took him to urgent care. She's the kind of mother who's texting her husband who is at home, working from home. The up talk is where gonna is drive Ethan? me crazy. Where is Ethan, where is Ethan? At 314 in the afternoon. The up talk is gonna drive me crazy. Getting texts back saying, Ethan gets home at 316, what's your problem? What's your and problem? She's texting, where is he, where is he? You will see that if anything, Jennifer Crumbly was a hypervigilant mother who cared more about her son than anything in the world. Jennifer Crumbly is not a perfect parent and we don't claim that she is. But what the evidence is going to show in this case is that the prosecution has very selectively 
pulled out slivers of evidence from a forest of trees to try to convince you that there was something wrong with Ethan and Jennifer Crumbly as his mom should have known. And at the end of the day, these slivers of evidence that are going to be presented to you will have no context and no explanation. And the defense will agree that on their face, it looks bad. But like any of you who look back at text messages sent a year ago, they may look bad without context and explanation. And so we would ask that you reserve any judgment on these slivers of evidence until the defense presents evidence itself. And we will be presenting evidence in this case to show the context and what was truly happening on these days that the prosecution is going to try to make you believe something more was happening. By way of example, the prosecution has one day where they claim Ethan needed help and Jennifer Crumbly was out with her horse. James Crumbly was with her at the barn. They had just gotten a new horse. Ethan is 15 years old at home claiming there's a demon in the house, there's something going on, and the prosecution is going to try to use this one little point in time to convince you that Jennifer Crumbly was somehow neglecting her son. I don't know. I, I think if my son told me there was a demon in the house, it might get my attention over the horse, but I'm just saying. Who is not on trial in this case. He has a separate trial, as Mr. Keese told you. You're going to hear evidence that James. Crumbly why couldn't I? Why couldn't I attend to my son? Like who was telling me that there were demons in the house. I was too busy with my horse. Isn't quite the response I was hoping for. Earlier in 2021, and a gun that was purchased at a Black Friday sale the day after Thanksgiving in 2021. You are going to hear evidence that James and Ethan went to the shooting range often that James was responsible for storing the guns and to be quite during the guns Jennifer Crumbly didn't know anything about guns Jennifer Crumbly you will hear evidence she went to the shooting range one time with James and the shooter and she went a second time after the gun was bought she was attempting to find a way to spend time with her son who had just lost a dog had just his friend had moved away from him she's trying to find a way to connect to him but on that day when jennifer crumbly went to the shooting range you will hear evidence that she didn't even know where the gun was or how to put it in the car she had her husband prepare the gun to take it to the range. She uh, had hid the gun in the bedroom of their home. The gun had a cable lock, a trigger lock in place. James Crumbly had the key to the trigger lock that kept the gun secure. James Crumbly used the trigger lock key took the, the cable lock off, put the gun in the back of Miss Crumbly's car. Mrs. Crumbly simply drove to the gun range. You will see video of their experience at the gun range and you will see that the shooter is the one showing Mrs. Crumbly how to use the gun at the range. And when they're done at the range, the gun was placed back in the back seat of the car not back seat, but the back of an SUV. And Jennifer Crumbly drove home and not being responsible for storing the gun and not even knowing where the gun specifically was placed. Jennifer Crumbly left the gun locked in the trunk, the back part of her SUV. And James Crumbly was responsible for getting the gun out, putting the trigger lock back on, storing the gun and Mrs. Crumbly had nothing to do with that part of what happened. 
Over the next couple of days, this is right after Thanksgiving, the family is picking out their Christmas tree, talking about Christmas presents. There was certainly some sadness in the shooter's life, but nothing that would have amounted to any reason to believe he's going to shoot people or commit a school shooting. You will hear testimony that on the day of the shooting, Jennifer Crumbly went to work. She is essentially the breadwinner at this time. Mr. Crumbly was in between jobs. He's about to get a job offer. Mrs. Crumbly is trying to keep about to get a job her offer. Up. She's at work and she finds out through an email and text message that her son has drawn this alarming drawing the prosecution put on the screen. Jennifer freaks out when she sees the drawing. You will see the text messages that show she's urgently texting her husband, emergency, call me now, and she races out of work and goes to yeah, I've, I have seen worse openings. That is a fair. That is a fair point. School. I have definitely, she I have seen worse. Sean Hopkins, the school counselor, she meets with Nick Ejak, the school principal, and she meets with James Crumbly and the shooter. And they are all in a room together where the shooter explains why he has put together this drawing and what the drawing means. The family and the school talk about how a counselor would be a good idea for even, I'm sorry, the shooter to get into something. You give the opening a C minus, that feels very fair. The meeting is not. It feels very fair. C minus feels very fair. As Mrs. Crumbly was initially yeah. expecting, trained professionals at the school who evaluate children represent that the shooter is of no risk to anyone and they allow him to stay in school. The testimony will show this is not a situation where Jennifer Crumbly refused to leave or refused to take her child from the school. She has some good points She's in there. It's just the not as well organized as I would like. Or leave him here. It's a little scattered the in the presentation. When they had online school, it doesn't, COVID, the, the opening doesn't really have a good flow from portion to, to portion. School. It feels too and scattered. She wanted to stay that and the way she started was, the school was fine with it. not great. Mrs. Crumbly did leave the school and left the shooter at the school, not knowing at the school he was going to become the shooter. I feel like I should dock her just for the up talk, though. I don't know if that's mean or not. Jennifer Crumbly, the evidence is going to show you, returns to work. And suddenly there is news that there's an open shooter at Oxford. Jennifer Crumbly, it's not even on her radar that her son would be the one with the gun doing anything. Her immediate concern is that her son may be hurt. As she is driving to the school as fast as she can, she has conversations with her husband and becomes aware that the gun at their house is missing. Let's up talk. And up talk is this. Mind, it's where you it's this. where you end your sentences she in an upward inflection. Perhaps her son has it's it's where it's stupid. where you say something and it has an upward the talk at the end of a at the end of a word or end of a sentence. She's still alive and believes that it's going to be okay. Whatever's happened, they can cross that bridge. A little bit later, there's more conversations, and Mrs. Crumbly becomes concerned that the shooter is actually attempting suicide. And Jennifer Crumbly texts her son, Ethan, don't do it. It still has not crossed her mind that he would ever shoot another person. Ultimately, Jennifer and James Crumbly are called to the substation where they learn that their son has become a school shooter and has shot people and that there are fatalities. Jennifer Crumbly will, will tell you 
She's still that's right, that Scaff. Leave. It's it's very that it's very associated true. with Valley Girl. And went into Valley Girl a speak. State of shock. And She's despair. a Valley Girl. And Valley girl. And not knowing sure, for sure. What, like, oh my God. Yeah, it's a little, yeah, it's very associated with Valley Girl. That's right. And her initial comments are about how her son, how could her son have ruined so many lives that day? Jennifer Crump. It was Zappa. You got it. That's right. At the substation. Yeah, that's right. And for the first time, when he looks at her, his eyes looked black. And it was a son she did not recognize. See, evil Kerman is already over here. Yeah, don't make fun of people's speech types. See, you're ruining my fun. Don't tell me what to do. It's my channel. I'll do what I want. Law enforcement takes their cell phones, um, which the Crumbleys handed over. The Crumbleys have to go... And by burger I need a, or track phones, I need a, I need a, a command for that so I can type it. Just a, a command that I can do. It says, don't tell me what to do. It's my channel. I do what I want. Around their house. What should, what should the uh, command be? What should it be? Exclamation house. mark what? And they cannot what should it be in their home. Jennifer Crumbly. Exclamation mark Crumbly shut up. Drive to Exclamation mark shut your face. Where they spend the night. They are trying to figure out what is happening and all jennifer can think about are the things she believes she can control like keeping her job keeping health insurance figuring someone out just money, tell me to shut up figuring out lawyers gritty well one of the mods digest. please time out gritty for five minutes so that he can shut the hell up it's my channel i'll talk when i want belma says stop talking let's time belma out for five minutes anyone else want to tell me what to do well, the prosecution Gritty. says the evidence will Time show him out. Thanks Crumbly for five minutes. Lying. Jennifer Crumbly is truthfully telling the world she had no idea and finding out that she is about to be charged. New, new rule. New rule for the mods. Anyone who tells me what to do gets timed out so they can think about what they said. Jennifer and James Crumbly go to the bank. They're advised by friends and family. And you will go forth, mods. Go forth and enforce my will. Money could all be taken out of their accounts, and they know they need money to be able to live and hire lawyers and figure out what to do. They withdraw all of the money from their bank account. The burner phones they're using, they can't get access to any of their accounts because of this two-part uh, authentication you now have to do. So they go to the Metro PCS store where they buy new telephones that they can actually use to access their social media, their accounts, their contacts, and they end up with multiple cell phones. After that, they- Oh, bite me? I like bite work me. to find lawyers. I like that, that's good, I like that. I'll do that, I like do. bite me. They don't understand what they're being charged with. They're under the stress of knowing their son is going to, is gone, and, and life will never be the same undoubtedly and on friday december 3rd the crumbleys find out when a press conference is held that they are being charged with four counts of involuntary manslaughter and at that point they work try, they attempt to try to figure out what to do where to stay where to go what to do and they ultimately ask a friend if they can stay at his art studio until they know where to go and what to do. They make plans to turn themselves in to the court on Saturday morning, because remember this is late in the day Friday. Saturday Friday. morning. Turn in morning to the, the court, court is late in the day Friday. Weekend arraignments. And overnight, the prosecutor's office, the sheriff's department, the fugitive apprehension team, the U.S. Marshals have a statewide search claiming that James Crumbly and Jennifer Crumbly are on the lam. They are running. They are fleeing. They are trying to avoid charges, and it couldn't be any further from the truth. They are at their friend's art studio. They are waiting for instructions and they are waiting to turn themselves in first thing Saturday morning when arraignments take place at the court. 
James and Jennifer Crumbly are sleeping on a mattress in the middle of the night when police locate them. You will hear evidence. They're not really hiding. They're standing outside their car, their vehicle, smoking cigarettes. They're standing outside their car, um, talking on the telephone. They're communicating with various people they know. There's absolutely no evidence to suggest that they're fleeing. You will see body camera footage where when police come into the art studio to find them dead asleep on this mattress, they are cooperative, they are taken into custody, and they are arrested. The prosecution has grossly misconstrued facts in this case, and I ask that you wait to make any judgment until all of the evidence has been presented and you have seen every detail of it, including Jennifer Crumbly's testimony, and she is going to take the stand and tell you about her life with her son, about the day he became the shooter, and about the day he did something she could have never anticipated or fathomed or predicted. She will tell you that when she saw the materials in this case, she learned that her son had not been her son for months, <laughs> that he had been manipulating her. Yeah, who's this, this guy on my screen talking? <laughs> exactly. That he had been sending you know? texts. I mean, not for nothing, right? You can always go watch the long crime feed if you just want to watch it. I'm a commentary channel. I talk what I want. Do what I want. Do what I want. Advised Mrs. Crumbly of problematic issues that if she had heard about, she would have jumped right on top of it. Despite the fact the evidence will show that Mrs. Crumbly is on power schools, managing missing assignments by her son. Is this is grades. this guy on the, the prosecutor's table on the far left on screen? Is he wearing a badge on his pocket? What the fuck is that? About a test he had failed. Is he wearing a badge? To the office, what bullshit is that? Was never informed. You will hear testimony. She was never informed that the shooter wrote an autobiographical get to know you poster where he says he feels what the fuck his family's a mistake. The school never notified Mrs. Crumbly of this. You will hear testimony. Why is he sitting at council table? What the fuck is this? Mrs. Crumbly that the shooter was having a quote rough time when he spoke to why and why is he sitting at council's table what you the hell is the that testimony that the school never notified miss crumbly that previous work found in the shooter's files showed that it leaned a little bit towards the violent side you will hear testimony that the school never told Mrs. Crumbly about an index card. Could it be security? No, he couldn't be security because we got five officers standing by the wall. He's not security. And even if he is security, why is he sitting at council's table? That doesn't make sense. There's a chair right behind him. He could sit there. That'd be fine. Mrs. Crumbly was never told. Much of the this is some bullshit. The school had. This is some bullshit, and I object and so to this. When the prosecution is urging you not to assign fault to anyone else, detective in the, the Vander case, he case sat with the prosecution. I, I call bullshit evidence. either way. I don't. This I I I, I reject your precedent. And quite frankly, and I'm calling bullshit. And know what There's no reason what for the detective to sit with the prosecutor at the prosecutor's table. That's just bullshit. That kind of stuff will not fly in my courtroom. Presenting. Get your ass behind. Get your ass in the chair somewhere else. Fuck you. Not foreseeable. This was absolutely. Not I don't care expected. who he is. Lead investigator. I don't care who the hell he is. You sit your ass somewhere else. Not guilty of involuntary manslaughter. Thank you, Ms. Smith. And you definitely don't wear your badge I'm gonna ask the judge while you're sitting at counsel's table. That's some bullshit. I knew I shouldn't have given a copy. <laughs> um, okay, so, um, so we'll take like a 10-minute break, and then we'll hear the first witness, okay? All right, cool. All right, we, have time. we have time to catch up then. 
Yeah, so real fast before we catch up, uh, just our all thoughts on the opening. The prosecution laid out a very good idea. He was well organized. He seemed to be reading it, but that's okay. I mean, ideally, I'd like him to memorize it. He's had time to memorize the speech, so he could just memorize it and that would be fine. But he read it, but it was well organized and well prepared and it made the case very well. So you got to give him credit where credit is due. You know, I give it an A. You know, I give it an A. Well organized. Good. It highlighted what he needed to highlight. It was quick. It didn't overstay its welcome. That's worth some bonus points alone that it didn't overstay its welcome. Got through basically just the basic highlighting of the case. And also he knows he has a bit of a problem because the school shooter obviously did the school shooting. So he has to show why this mom is responsible or should be held responsible. So he didn't avoid the obvious. And I appreciate that. He knows he has a weakness and he dealt with his weakness immediately. He didn't hide the ball. He's like, yes, Ethan did the school shooting. Yes, he's the one who did it. The mother should still be held responsible. Here are the reasons why. And he went through some ideas. And I'm like, okay, these ideas make coherent sense. So I'll give the prosecutor a solid A. Good work. Defense lawyer, C- minus at best. The Taylor Swift opening is just garbage. And I don't believe her, incidentally. She says... I was blasting Taylor Smith Swift on the law. So either one, I don't believe her or two, it's dumb. So she's like, I, I was streaming. I was listening to Taylor Swift and blasting it as I went to work today, today. And this is the song I heard. Now I'm like, I don't think that's true. Cause I think that was a prepared and canned line. So first of all, I don't believe you. Second of all, even if I did believe you, the idea that you changed your opening because of a song you heard on the radio today is not exactly endearing to you. So either you're a liar or a bad attorney. So it's not a lot of great possibilities. Her overall speech was disorganized and didn't really flow from point to point, unlike the prosecutors, which flowed. I could follow where he was going and where he went made sense from where he came from. Not so much with the defense lawyer, especially during the first, first half. She got a little bit better in the back half and sort of some problems relating to that. She highlighted some ideas, but she overplayed, especially in the first half, to the to the to the emotional element of the thing, rather than talking about the witnesses she was going to bring and what case she was going to raise. So it was a little emotional emotional heavy. It was a little emotionally manipulative, heavy in the beginning when it wasn't required. That, to the extent that that was a good idea, it probably should have come at some later point in the speech. But maybe she had a different idea that she wanted to deal with the emotions right right away because of the emotional nature of the case. Also because of what the prosecutor showed. So maybe it was de a deliberate tactical choice. But if it was a deliberate tactical choice, I'm not sure that she went about it the best possible way. So I'll give her a C-. minus. It was serviceable, but in comparison to the prosecution's opening, left quite a lot to be desired. The badge could be a concealed carry badge. I guarantee you it's not. I want you to think about what you just said. I want you to think about it real hard. There's a guy sitting at the prosecution's table with a concealed carry badge, which would imply that he doesn't have any other right to carry but for concealed carry. Do you really think the judge would allow a person whose only ability to carry is because of a concealed carry permit to not only carry a gun into the courtroom, but sit at the prosecution's table. Think about what you said and reconsider it. <laughs> All right, let's go ahead and, and catch up. We're now three minutes behind real time, so that worked well for us. I think we can just skip to live. It is um, number seven. Um, are, you, are you stipulating to the admission of the other ones or not? I, yes. I, I know we were going to talk about this yes. at some point. Yes, I believe that um, Mr. Nell's exhibits five. Six, also, her cadence. Seven, eight. Her cadence wasn't no very those. great. It was too sing-songy. And I believe that's already been a ruling by the court. I just have to continue my objection. Okay, so this this was ruled on previously. Yes. Okay. Right. 
All right, so seven was already it was already admitted in a written opinion. It was, right? Judge. Okay. I just have to maintain my objection. Sure. Thank sure. you. Okay. For the record, that is a portion of the Oxford High School uh, surveillance footage. Correct. Okay. And for the record, we just think it it's not necessary. The defendant is in this gray sweatshirt hoodie thing at defense table, which is a strange look, but that's apparently what we're going for. The defendant is in this gray hoodie, sweatshirt, whatever. Do you swear or affirm the testimony about to give as a true self after that? Yes. Okay, you can be seated. And then um, could you state your name for the record and spell your first and last name? My name is Molly Darnell, M-O-L-L-Y, D-A-R-N-E-L-L. Go ahead, press Good morning. Good morning. I'm going to call you Molly. I assume that's okay. That's okay. Okay. Um, Molly, can you tell the jury what your profession is? I'm an educator. Where is it? Are you a teacher? I am a teacher. Okay. Um, and who is your employer? Oxford Schools. Okay. How long have you been in, uh, how long have you worked for Oxford Schools? I started working for Oxford in the fall of 98. Okay, would that be your entire career? That is my entire career. Okay, and you stayed in that one school district? Correct. Okay. Um, your current position is what? Um, I work for Oxford Virtual Academy. All right. And when did you begin that position? I began that position 18 months ago. Okay. Uh, I'm going to take you back to November 30th, 2021. Can you tell the jury what your position was at that time? At that time in Oxford, I was um, under teacher contract, but I was the ELA coach and um, the international baccalaureate coordinator. So I worked specifically with curriculum and teachers, um, like instructional moves in the classroom. Okay. So, so ELA, what's ELA? I'm sorry. Thank you. It's English language arts. All right. Th thanks. thanks uh, so how much contact did you have with students compared to teachers at that point? I would say minimal in comparison to teachers. All right. And you you did, though, spend some time in the classroom in your career? Absolutely, yes. I spent the majority of my career in the classroom. Okay. Um, so on that day, um, what was your typical day like around that time in that position? So in that position, I would work with um, building kind of professional development opportunities or I was working with, you know, working with teachers individually on that day in particular, I was working with the media specialist and my other coaching colleagues, my other instructional coaching colleagues, I'm building professional development for the next day. All right. Did you have a classroom? I had an office uh, that I shared with two other individuals and it was like half a classroom, but it was in the educational um, hallway. So it was a classroom made into two offices. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, can you tell the jury when classes began that morning? What was the schedule of the day? It began and end, if you if you remember. Um, so you're referring to like the start day of the school yes. day? The school day started um, around 7.30 um, and ended around 3 o'clock. Um, and I know Oxford had a, a different, they didn't have exactly the same schedule every day. Yeah, they had a rotating seven, so we met six days a week. Um, or sorry, we met six classes a day, um, and we, but we had seven classes. So they, the students only were there in every single class for four hours All right. a week. Can you tell the jury what passing time is? Passing time was about Oxford's one of the larger high schools in the state. It's the largest single floor high school in the state, I think, at the time. Um, Do and you so, know how many students? I, I, you know, off the top of my head, I don't. Okay. Um, and... Um, and so there were about eight minutes between passing times, uh, or between passing. All right. November 30th, 2021, uh, were there any COVID protocols still in place? Yes, we were still in masks um, at that point in time, yes. And were lockers being used? Lockers were not being used. Okay, so how were the kids getting their things from class to class? They were carrying book bags. I'm going to um, show you what's been marked as people's proposed Exhibit 5. I don't believe there's an objection, Your Honor. That's when correct, I, Your Honor. When I say I'm going to show you, there's, it's going to be on this screen and this screen. Five submitted. <laughs> okay. Molly, what, what is that? Uh, that's the layout of the high school. 
All right, so that's a map of the school. Correct. Okay, and can you tell me where your classroom slash office was? Um, so if you're looking at that yellow portion, I am, um, thank you. Um, I am where you see 222, and then there's 226. I'm that little sliver right in between there, and that was 224. Okay, Mark's going to show you yep. on the map. He's Correct. not letting me have access to the clicker for the yep. trial, so we're relying <laughs> on him. Okay, so is that your classroom? Yes, that like little sliver where you can see, it looks like a bunch of names are written in there. Mm -hmm. um, that was the room that I was in, yes. Okay, and I'm going to take you to um, around the time of about 1250. Um, what were you doing during that time? So on that day, um, the, the year prior I was in the classroom and, um, and I had a student who popped by um, around that time just to check in and wanted to chat. Um, I had a chat with her. There was, I believe it was the beginning of passing that she stopped by. We had a quick little chat. Um, was that conversation in your it was office, in office or in the hallway? Yep, it was in the office. Was the door open or closed? The door was open. Okay. Um, we had a little chat. Um, she left. I was alone in the office. Um, and passing was still happening. So I moved to my um, my desk space just to check some emails, check on a, you know, a couple of things. Okay. So your desk was in the back of the classroom? Yeah, it was towards the back side, yes. Facing the door? Facing the door. Okay. Correct. Um, and did you have a practice of what you did during passing time? So sometimes I would go out in the hall um, and check, like just to check and see what was going on, or I might chat with the teacher or two. I didn't on that day because it was towards the end of passing time, and so I knew things would be wrapping up and teachers would be heading back to their classes. Okay. Uh, so at some point, did you see or hear anything unusual? Yeah, so... Um, all of a sudden, I could hear a commotion in the hallway, and I look, you know, looked up from my my laptop, and I see a bunch of kids running through the hallway. It was a pack of kids, um, and they were moving pretty quickly, and there was a commotion around it. Um, I couldn't tell if it was like excited, you know, that that it was like higher pitched though. And it was almost like some of the kids' hands were extended, like they were trying to move really quickly. Okay, for the record, you have your hands, both your hands yep. up, shoulder. Um, okay, and that seemed unusual to you? It did. Okay, did it seem unusual because of the, it was at the end of passing time, or just because of the movement and the sound? It was the movement, it was the sound, it was the large bulk of kids okay. that were moving. Um, what did you do? What did you do? Um, I exited my office. I believe that there was possibly a fight. Um, so I, I run out of my office. I'm about midway through where 222 is. Um, and I see all those kids exiting out of door four. So I know there's not a fight. So if you look at the map, you come out of your classroom and you look down the hallway and they're all running out of the school. Yeah, on a door four. Okay, and that was unusual. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? Yes, yeah, so I had never seen that before. All right. Um, and and then what happened? Um, I paused for a second because I'm thinking like, well, what what is what's going on, right? I don't know what's happening. Um, I head back into my my office space. The hallway is completely clear. Um, and I walk into my office and I'm like, all right, what? What could possibly be happening in this moment? Was was it unusual for the hallway to be completely clear? Um, the, I don't believe the bell had rung yet, so okay. that was unusual. Okay. And so, what did you do? Um, it was uh, in pausing, um, trying to like gather what to do next. I heard three things pretty quickly together, like so quickly together that I have a hard time distinguishing what had came first and what came last. Um, but there were the sound of like three, like loud pops. 
um, that I could have mistaken for lockers closing if we weren't using lockers. Okay. So when you heard the laugh of three pops, what did you think that, that sound was? I, well, again, there was, there was that, there was, um, doors started slamming. I could hear like boom, 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 boom. And, um, and then uh, the principal at the time, Steve Wolf, came over the PA and said, um, we're heading into lockdown. This is, not a, this is not a drill. And how long had you known Steve? Uh, so a couple years at that point in time. Okay. Did his voice sound panicked? Um, his voice sounded, it was like um, urgent, but you could tell he was like tempering any, um, you know, like panic. So was that before the, the loud pops or after, if you can remember? Honestly, I, I, I cannot remember. Okay. When you heard this, was your door open or closed? My door, when I came back in, um, I pulled it, but it didn't shut. So it was open um, a couple inches. Okay. So what did you do? Um, at that point in time, I moved to shut my door. Okay. Um, did you, after the pop, did you smell anything? No. Did you see anything? No. All right. Then you t tell the jury what happened when you turned around and headed to the door. So um, I walked to the door. I immediately pull it shut. Um, to the left of my door. So my door was here and there was a glass part, like, you know, floor to ceiling glass. And then right here was a night lock system. Can you tell the jury what a night lock system is? So a night lock is a simple gadget that goes into the door that goes into the floor so that if the door were unlocked, it's like a second security measure. Oh, um, if the door was not locked or even if it was, it's showing um, you the wrong so can't get image. It, so if the glass is shut out, they, even if they're trying to undo yeah. the door, they can't um, open the door. Yeah. Well, why did you learn about night locks? Um, well, I apologize for the video being paused before. Okay. Right. So as soon as I knew that we're, we're in lockdown, that's what I apologize did. for the video being paused. It was paused um, for quite a while, wasn't it? Did you, were you able to install? <laughs> Sorry, my bad. So I grabbed the night lock, you know, I undid the, the, the piece, grabbed it, um, and looked down at it. So I also, um, some of the doors have different installs, whether the door goes, you know, in or out of mm -hmm. the room. And so I looked at it to see, just remind myself which one, um, because the other office that I have at the middle school or had at the middle school at the time had at, a different. At this point, school. Molly, the door is shut or closed? The door is shut. Are you facing the door or facing the I'm away? facing the door, okay. so I'm, but I'm close enough to that wall because I had just grabbed it. Do you know about what the distance was between you and, and that door? Um, not even a foot. Okay. And then what happened? Um, I look at it. And out of my peripheral vision, I can see some sort of movement. Um, and so I look up. Um, and I see someone dressed in dark, oversized clothing. And you're looking through that glass pane next pain. to your door. Okay. Uh, they have the mask on, uh, a hat, glasses, and a hood. Um, and I lock eyes with them. Had you ever seen that person before? I had not, no. Did you know if it was a student or is that a no? I, have, I did not know if it was a student. All right. And you said you locked eyes? I locked eyes. Um, and then instantly I noticed, I see some, some movement. And so I looked down and um, I realized he's raising a gun to me. Okay. Can you describe? Yeah, the gun, um, the gun was, was black. And I remember thinking, uh, he was, he's raising the gun to me, but there was no orange tip. Um, I had heard prior that BB guns have an orange tip. When you say he was raising the gun, can you explain what that, what that looked like? Um, was it, was it, one arm or two arms? Well, I just saw the one starting to move up. I saw the gun. And it's I recording didn't hesitate. in progress. Which way did you move? Okay. I moved away. About from how long, long was that from the time you saw I'm the gun? change feeds real fast. Give me a second to make it work. The gun was raised. A second? Okay. If that. 
when you locked eyes with this individual, what did you see? I'm sorry, can you repeat that question? Describe that for me. Um, I lock eyes with him and I instantly see that movement. Can I not do and this I with Zoom? Hold on. <sighs> I have to make this work. I hate my life. What happened after you I'll, I'll fix it in, I'll fix it on a break um, so I don't as have I to jump, jump live. I mean, and that's it. Was the night, did you ever get the night lock installed at the room? Okay. You just described, you saw something in your peripheral vision. I'll change it up. during a break. Um, you locked eyes. I locked eyes. He didn't hesitate. Okay. About how long was that from the time you saw the peripheral vision and then the gun was raised? A second. Okay. If that, when you locked eyes with this individual, what did you see? I'm sorry, can you repeat that question? Describe that for me. Um, I lock eyes with him and I instantly see that movement. And I jumped to the side. Okay. <clears throat> what happened after you jumped to the side? Um, as I jumped, I mean, and was the night, did you ever get the night lock installed at that the point? The night lock is not installed at this point. Okay. So when I move, um, I kind of jump and turn my body this way at the same time. Okay, and you're... For the record, you're motioning, turning your yeah. shoulders to the right. To the right. Mm -hmm. um, and I feel uh, like my my left shoulder moves back a bit, and I feel a burn like hot water had stung me. Where did you feel that? Um, in my um, arm. Which arm? In my left arm. Okay. I'm and you're pointing to your, your, well, shoulder, Lauren. your shoulder? Yep. People in chat might be defending them on a legal level because we do have significant legal concerns about whether the parents can be held legally responsible. So whether they're bad parents is not necessarily the issue. So I, I do have significant concerns about their liability for involuntary manslaughter. So we might be defending them on that sense. Okay, I'm going to um, show you on the screen what's been marked as um, people's proposed exhibit yeah. six. I am skeptical of the state's theory of the case from a fundamental legal level. Uh, that's the office that I shared. Okay. And that, can you just describe where the desk is, where, what, what you just described and point that out? You said yep. you turned around um, to the back of the classroom. Yep. So you keep me posted on treetop. Sitting, there's a white mark. I don't think you have to be a sick person to think they're culpable either. I don't think we have to be that dramatic about it. You know, we don't have to. We don't have to be that dramatic about it. I don't think you have to be sick to think they should be held responsible. I think you can also be doubtful they should be responsible. But you know, the the legal question, at least in part, is how does this case speak to the set of cases? Because that's how I, as a lawyer, think about it. How does this case speak to the set of cases? Wrap my head around what was And what does this say about the set of cases? So, I mean, after you felt the, the warm... At some point, at least to me, you sort of have to ignore the case yeah. okay. and think about the meta. So what did you because that's what common law does. And so I'm concerned uh, about the meta. The night lock's not installed at this point. The at this point and, and the only thing I'm thinking is I have to barricade this door. Like, there was instinct that kicked in. Um, so what you can't see is right around that corner, there was this huge filing cabinet. And I think if, if you point, so to the, around that corner to, yeah. Okay. And, um, so I grab it because I'm afraid to go back towards the door at this point in time. And I try to move it thinking maybe I can pull it out enough and push it. And it was just too heavy for me. So that rolling cart was sitting next to it. Um, that's when I pulled out the rolling cart and I no, sorry, I take that back. It's okay, I didn't do that yet. Take your time. I crawled down on my hands and knees and I put that mm -hmm. night lock in. Um, and then I moved for the rolling. Yeah, like just just, just remember that slippery slope is not so much a fallacy 
is the object in law as a uh, reasonable object. prediction because that's what common law does. Yeah. Oh, that's so the yeah. Yes. Okay, but that it's sitting on the that's the rolling cart, right? Correct. Okay. All right. And were you able to put it in front of the door? I was able to put the rolling cart in front of the door. Correct. Okay. And then what did you do? Um, then the only thing I can think of is he's going to come back and finish what he wanted to do. Could you hear anything else in the hallway? At this point, I'm not hearing anything. Okay. And so what did you do? So I could t I go back to that large. If you provide alcohol and car keys to your son, you can be held to account. Can see. What's different here? So well, you would be held to account in a civil so way. I'm not sure you could be held criminally responsible. I don't know. Large filing cabinet back just you could absolutely be sued for so sure, but could you be no charged with a crime? I'm not so sure. And even so if you were charged with a crime, are, it would be more in the in the spirit is, of child neglect you have to be at a certain angle than in certain what the child did as a result of that. Correct. Correct. Okay. And so, yeah, I don't think the situation you suggest is on point. Because what? Because I, I, I didn't want him to see where I was at. Okay. Once you were behind the cabinet, um, were, you, were you sitting? Uh, I was crouched down. Um, I was trying to make myself as small as possible. Why are teenagers involved in gang violence held criminally responsible? Um, that's a very good question. Crouched as close together. And that's a reasonable question to ask when you're thinking about the set of cases. Right? So this is the difference between what about ism and how I think. I love you after right? the shooter. So to, to me, the difference between what about ism. So when you ask the question about why aren't mothers of gang members charged? What did you do? To my mind, how I think about that is, well, should they be charged? Should they be charged? Because the logic of one should flow to the logic of the other. Right? So your question to me is trying to define the category of things. It's like, what is the category of things? Is this the same thing or the same category of things as a parent who knows about things that lead to gang violence by their son? I think that's a reasonable question. Bleeding, and then the question might be, well, if we uh, if we there, if we want to charge those back, people, do we necessarily have to charge so, this person, um, so and vice way, versa? You so, you're, if you're bleeding, trying to figure about what the set of cases is, it's a valid question. Um, I removed my cardigan and I used one of the sleeves of the arm, uh, wrapped it up on top, and pulled with one arm and my my teeth with the other uh, to tighten it. And Molly, um, how many inches down was that? wound um it sits right here okay and you brought a cardigan so that you could show mm -hmm. the jury what that yeah. looks like so they know exactly where you were headed yeah. i'm not even sure that the gangsta mom necessarily needs to buy the gun for this theory to work mm -hmm. as long as they're aware their child has guns and is a danger so i think the you. i think the logic okay. would work so. Everyone see? Mm -hmm. yes. so i'm not sure buying the gun is what turns back. the analysis so I turned that was the entrance on the exit and there's two holes there Yep. So it entered here. I think this will be a landmark case if it's guilty. Between, yes, uh, I think it will. I think it's also very difficult to believe that the okay. that the the logic of this case stops um, here. You put the tourniquet where on your shoulder? I put it above the wound. Okay. How do you know how to do that? Um, we go through trainings um, once a year regarding um, what to do. Okay. You know, in the situation. What what happened next? Um, I put the tourniquet on. I'm sorry if that's too much legal philosophy, but and it, that's and sort of what I do because I'm a legal commentary what, channel. So legal philosophy next? is part of my part of my job. I was and trying to say was trying to say saying, what what is this uh, thing like? Didn't go to Oxford High School. What are other she things that are like this? What is the start. rule that applies to things like um, this? And because I'm, a, I, I think by rule, and I think by category. I'm a categorical so thinker. So yeah, for me, it's like trying to define the category of things, and then what is the rule for the category of things? And because I ideally want to apply the rule consistently in the category of things, so I want to be consistent. That's that's good. Molly, I want to go back, and I'm so sorry. When um, the shooter raised his his hand, um, what what were your um, 
what did you notice about if you noticed anything about his stance or you said you locked eyes yeah his feet were set about hip distance apart Owen brought up the july 4th grade um, shooter that charged that dad was charged for co-signing to get his child a gun I can't speak you know, to that particular was, case. I'm not aware of it, shoulder, so like I won't comment on it further because I'm not sure what that um, case is or what it means, or incidentally, um, what that yes. person was charged with. Um, because what he's charged with would depend, right? The the else. parent might very well be held responsible under um, any number of other legal theories. No. Uh, so if we're trying to charge the parent with some other crime, maybe. My, my hallway had a text but then, the, then the then the then the then the nature of the category of things would change. Right, because but another part of the the, the facts the would be determined. The facts are relevant to the category, and, and, and so what is the category of things? What was that shooter. person charged with? And I responded that I and I might come up with a completely different answer you because you've changed the category of thing. That? That? That's not inconsistency. That's just logical oh, thinking. I think Right. So under these set of facts, I'd have no problem charging the parents with neglect or maybe abuse or something. I, I, don't, I don't know. There's any number of charges I would have no problem charging the parents with because it's a different category of thing. If anyone else had been hurt, what were you hearing? Anything? Nothing. And it was it was absolute silence for a long time. Um, and then um, I started to hear a volume of footsteps. And I thought. They must be evacuating a classroom. Um, and so when that shift occurred, I texted the teacher next door and I said, hey, um, you're the only one that knows right now, but I've been- If you gave your child alcohol and he caused drunk driving, would you be held responsible? Civilly, yes. Criminally, I don't think so. How long was that? How long were you in the room? At that point, it was, it was probably 18, 15, 18 minutes. Or at least I'm doubtful. Somebody, How about that? Did somebody ask you to leave the, the classroom? The Delany, the, the, the yes. dad was so charged with felony reckless for, conduct? Like, oh my gosh. Um, okay. Home. That might be that might be a viable yeah. cause of action. There's another teacher in the room with her. I'd have to really get into it and really consider it. Okay. But it's definitely not the same it thing as involuntary like, manslaughter. Yep. So, the text so even if I got into it and reached the conclusion that that father should be held responsible I don't, I don't, for felony reckless conduct, I'm not sure the degree to which that conclusion would necessarily read on this particular nothing, case uh, Molly, because it's Molly, arguably a different category of thing. Um, I've known Kurt since, since I started. You could be charged with corruption of a minor. Yeah, fair. But that's a different category of thing. So, sure. Corruption of a minor? I, I'm on board. That's fine. Yeah, that's fine. No problem. It's a different category of thing. I don't know. Child abuse, uh, child neglect, corruption of a minor, delinquency of a minor. Sure. All these things make sense. No problem. So did you answer him back or did you open the door? Or did you the charge is involuntary manslaughter. I, I said, I'm, I'm in here. And he said, are you okay? Um, I don't remember how I responded. It was within a second or two that... Um, but then there were police at the door and they were like, are you in here? Are you injured? I said, yes. Um, and then I said, I think I said, do you want me to, uh, it was, it was clear that they wanted me to like, we were going to, they were going to, they were there for me. And they couldn't, they couldn't just open the door. They can't just open that door, that night lock. Um, Parents will have a different perspective versus non-parents. Well, Molly, if you know, how would you get into in the that? end, of course, it's a legal it question, so the we have to be consistent so about it. Use, so you, you have to apply a consistent logical thinking. So, the frame so as long as you have a consistent rule, uh, and then, so you know, maybe, get, but we'll so talk about make, it, right? Did you do that? If you have a well, consistent said, rule, then I'll start the attacking the rule. I'm like, that's the wrong rule for the category of things, and we can have a discussion about that. And, uh, and if I you're not even consistent ground, about the rule, then I'm not sure what we're even talking line, about. Then you're just into special pleading. From my knees. You know, if it's, oh, it's because it's my child, and they, like, that's not a good legal argument. And I can see it might be a very good argument as a parent, but it's not a great years. legal argument. I need a little bit more than because it's your child, like you know? Flowers. And I can see four cops with guns. Did you see any students? I did not see any students, no. 
Okay, Molly, I'm going to play um, a surveillance. Which What's my opinion? I'm legally skeptical. Seven, which I know there is a, a I'm legally here. skeptical of this um, cause of action. This, I'm legally this, skeptical this, of the Court of Appeals um, decision this, this, allowing this cause of action. I am deeply skeptical of this as a matter of law. That is my stance at the moment. I'm willing to have my mind changed as I consider further, but I'm skeptical on this cause of action. While he's uh, getting that on the monitor, um, this isn't a question of fact for me. To this isn't a question of fact for me because I'm willing to assume for the sake of this discussion that everything the prosecutor says is true because for me it's ultimately a legal question. I mean, obviously a jury, obviously a trial is about facts, but for the sake of the legal discussion, I'm willing to assume the premise because that's what lawyers sometimes do. I'm willing to assume the premise. Everything the prosecution says is true. Okay, so therefore what conclusion given that, given that premise? What conclusion should follow? And that's where I get um, yep, a little bit, mm, I'm not sure. The, yep. the prosecutor says everything is true, therefore involuntary manslaughter. I'm like, okay, I'll agree with you. Everything is true. I'm not sure about involuntary manslaughter. I'm not sure that makes sense. I am skeptical. And so they're just, um, they were just around, right, as well, like securing the area, I suppose. All right, can you press play? She maybe should be charged with something. I, I don't have any particular objection to the idea that the, the prior parent should be charged with something. But at the moment, all I'm trying to decide is whether or not she can be guilty of this charge. That's the legal question I'm trying to solve at the moment. Because that's what's the, that's the issue. That's the question. Can she be, can she be found guilty of this legal charge? And that's like, I'm not sure. At this point, are you hearing any anything in the building? No, uh, the, everything is silent. Like uh, almost like. Thank you for the super chat. Off. Given that we allow Myers to avoid criminal liability, God, which so isn't silent. completely true, we just do go about it a different way. Glass door. Um, that is me. What's happening? We would. It like, seemed legally justifiable to hold the parent guardian criminally liable. Market. No, I don't think that makes sense. Um, he's you have to hold each market. person responsible for their own acts, not the acts of another. That's that's a really bad way to do law. Yes. So at this point, um, he says, "I'm going to radio to see." If but thank you for your super chat. For you. I appreciate um, your support. Uh, making sure that no one else needed it ahead of me. Okay. The charge is involuntary manslaughter. You eventually get into an ambulance. They take you where? They took me to look here. What happened when you got there? Um, so I um, get to look here. I'll add it to the and, video description so people don't have to keep asking me. The doctor comes out to the ambulance and introduces himself. Um, and they said, I was sitting in the ambulance the entire time. And then they said, we're going to put you on the gurney. Um, and I said, I can walk, I can walk. Like if I can walk, I want to walk. And so they help me out of the ambulance and I walk in and they're like studying, you know, like hold, kind of almost holding me up, studying me. And the hallways are lined with doctors and nurses. Did you see any other victims? I did not, no. Okay. Um, and they treated your wound. They did. Okay. Um, were you able to, um, I, I assume they ran some tests. I want to be <coughs> cognizant of the judge's prior ruling about um, what you can testify to. But um, at what point, how long were you at the hospital? I have no idea what time I walked in those doors. Okay. Um, I was there for several hours. Um, did you learn at some point there were other victims? Um, I did ask when I was in the hospital. Um, is anybody else in it? Um, and and I was you know I was told that there were other victims and a few fatalities. Yes. Okay. At some point, did you hear a teacher was shot? I did. And what did you think? I I instantly thought it was um, another one of my colleagues. I knew the direction that I, you know, I saw him turn, so I knew what direction he came. 
And, and who was the teacher? Um, I thought it was Lauren Jasinski that was shot. But who was the teacher they referred to? It was me. At some point, um, you were shown weeks later um, a picture of your doorway. Mm -hmm. Do you remember that? I do. Okay. Do you remember who showed that to you? No. Okay. Was it was it me? I did. Well, I did see. Um, I did see it in your office. Yes. Okay. When you were preparing to testify. Yes. Um, I'm gonna put that picture on the on the screen. It's People's Exhibit Eight. I don't think there's a objection. Um, Any objection? There's no objection. It's submitted. Molly, is that your classroom door? That is my. Um, yes. Okay. Um, what was your reaction when you saw that? He was aiming to kill me. Do you know which one of those shots landed in your shoulder? I don't. Um, I have no idea which one landed in my shoulder, but I know the top one, that's where my head would have been, and the two down below are my chest area. Okay. I unlocked that door every day. And what was your, um, did you have some, what's your, what, what is, what is your, when you think about the, the wound and why you weren't hit, why was it in the chest? That door, the distance, the door, and me moving was the only reason that I'm alive. How many inches from your heart was that, uh, that injury to your shoulder? The actual wound is six inches. Um, but my my turn might have made it less. I have nothing further, Your Honor. Ross? I have no questions, Your Honor. Thank you. Can this witness be excused, Your Honor? Yes, please. <clears throat> you can step down and you're excused. All right. <clears throat> Who's the next witness? Christy Gibson Marshall. Okay. All right, I've, I've changed the video description to give a preview of the case. So in the, in the future, if anyone asks, what is this case about? Please kindly direct them to the description of the video. And you may also slightly chide them for not checking in the first place if you're so inclined. Okay. Chide them nicely, though. Don't, don't go overboard about it. Um, the media is asking whether or not they can videotape the uh, tape the video. I don't see a reason why they can't, right? No, there's no minors. Oh, okay. I just I want to make sure. Yeah. Judge, actually, this one in this portion. Yes. Oh, yes, in this portion. Um, we'll indicate which um, right which of uh, uh, videos can be shown. In the video. Okay. Yeah, give them a heads up. So they know. I'm also concerned of giving a heads up to the jury so everyone's prepared. And then, Your Honor, again, um, the defense objects to, I believe it's just one exhibit you're using with this witness. Oh, with this witness? So the first witness just laid the background about the shooting. Yeah. Some facts related well, here too. This is previously. I mean, you have to obviously show the shooting yes. occurred, as a matter of fact, because this is an independent trial. So you have to show the facts of what occurred, at least somewhat, because well, this is a new trial, and you have to represent the facts. So, fair enough. My headphone cable is incredibly tied up right now. I'm trying to fix this because it's all jammed up. There we go. That's better. Damn, Mike Boomer. All right, there we go. All right, there we go. So what are we thinking so far? I mean, good first witness. Nothing serious to write home about, but fine. Nothing, nothing bad there.
Did I get my new microphone? Yeah, I've had the new microphone for like two months now. I, I'm, I'm waiting on a boom arm today. But yeah, I've had this microphone, the SM7B, for like two months, and I should have bought it years ago. It may be a $400 microphone, but it's worth it. And it will last forever. So that's nice. You know, all the money I spent over the years on lesser quality microphones, you know, I bought, I bought a fair number of like $99 microphones. You know, if I just bought the one microphone in the first place, I could have saved myself a lot of trouble. You know what I mean? Could you raise your right hand? Do you swear or affirm the testimony that you live as a true Sahab today? All right, please be seated. And then would you state your name for the record and spell your first The name? mic is the Shure SM7B. SM7B. It's a great quality microphone. It's used by many podcasters, including Joe Rogan, who possibly made it famous. Thank you. Good morning. May I call you Christy? Yes. Christy, could you please tell the jury where you're employed? Oxford How long have you been with Oxford? 29 years. And what do you do right now? I'm an assistant principal. Okay. And that's at the high school? At my school. How long have you been the assistant principal at the high school? Six years. And what did you do before that? I was an elementary principal. Also in Oxford District? Yes. Now, if you could tell the jury a little bit about your role as an assistant principal. Um. What are some of your responsibilities? Teachers, supervision, um, evaluation, curriculum and instruction, um, supervising, uh, I do parent communications, um, it's hard to think of all the stuff that my big giant list while I'm sitting here, but um, we, we have a student relations team that works together to um, support our alphabet, um, part of the alphabet. The big goal is, like, to, to me, my, my biggest role is supporting students, and, and I love the kids, so just bringing energy and having fun with them. You've been in education except for 29 years? Oh, it's the wrong word, principal. Yes. So prior, it's P A L, not P L E. Elementary school principal. <sighs> I was, and then prior to that, I was a teacher. A teacher before that. Okay. There we go. Now, as it happens, the school that you were a principal at was Jennifer Crumbly's son, one of those students. Yes. Because the principal is your pal. Fourth and fifth. Did you have any contact with him in your role as a principal in those fourth and fifth grade years? in contact with his mother or father? Not that I remember. I had an email about a uh, report card once, but that's all I remember. That would have been I'll keep adjusting the audio as needed like to make it work. Grade going to sixth. I just have to do it manually all the time. It's a little bit frustrating. I'll, I'll now keep I'd working like to on it. Your to attention right. to November the 30th, I can't get the compressor settings to work the way I want to. In the to make it just work automatically, because so I can't figure it out. I don't know. I don't know how to. I, I've so read many so guides on compressors. But I, I can't seem to make it do what I want it to do. That's very annoying. If you could tell us, if you recall, where you were about 12.50 in the afternoon that day. I was in the cafeteria. I started in the cafeteria supervising lunches. So what would be, I guess... Fox 2 Detroit is streaming. Their right. video quality is better. I'm not sure how it could yes, be any better. Right. They're both using the same WebEx feed. So is that so, lunchtime uh, while you were there? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yes. <clears throat> and is there a time where you move... So around that around that time on November the thirtieth, we will try to use the WebEx feed at least going go forward. Um, but I don't want to play with it right now area, to make it work. But, um, so we'll try to switch to the WebEx I direct like feed. To go to the courtyard, but it's it's certainly um, serviceable for now. After lunches and just kind of help see this, yeah, that courtyard area, okay. the hallway out in front of this courtyard area between where you see four hundred and um, four hundred one. Okay, uh, our seniors hang out there. And they congregate um, in a good way. Not do we really need six officers by the state? Um, do we really need six officers right standing against the wall? And One, two, three, four, five. That's a lot of officers. Okay. Yeah. Is that something something you would do on a routine basis? 
Yeah, um, my bad mom joke on that one is that I make it a senior citizen window and I stand in that area. <clears throat> was there a, a point that day when you realized something was going wrong? When I was approaching the um, senior courtyard, so when I was coming down the hallway from the commons, what says commons, I call it cafeteria, by the media center, by the courtyard, um, and hit the 500 um, room, when I kind of got to that triangle there, that diamond there, um, one of the students that I know pretty well um, went running by. And I'm not going to switch feeds there. right now. And he was laughing and running. And I don't want to like, play with it while we're streaming. I don't want to. I don't want to switch feeds. Mixed message. Sure. That's so this this this, this feed is serviceable. We'll stick with it for the moment. No. Was he the only one running? Um, shortly after him, there was a group of kids laughing and running behind him. Um, when I stopped to ask them what was going on, they weren't entirely sure. Um, but as kids started to pass, you could see it got more serious. Okay. I grabbed my walkie-talkie and I. I, what do you mean it got more serious? What do you mean by that? Their faces got more. I'm sorry. Their faces became more serious. Okay. Did that signify something to you when you saw that? Yeah. Just something. Them running signified something to me because it's not a typical behavior. Okay. Um, but the running and laughing was confusing. And then when their faces became more serious, I was very, started to get very worried. And that's when I grabbed my walkie talkie. Okay. What did you do with your walkie talkie? I said I'm not sure what's happening but kids are running in the hallway which is very odd and um look like they're trying to leave the building so where did you go um I well they shortly after I got on the walkie they they went to Alice alert and so what's I what's Alice alert Alice alert is our it's our intruder i'm going to call it an intruder alert because that's what it was that day but it's a um notice that we need to take cover lock down be aware that's so is that emergency assistance you know alarm alert. ringing or is that somebody who's who's making giving a message over the pa system on that day it was a message over the pa system do you recall who, who gave that message steve wolf who is that she is our principal he's the principal so is this shortly after you saw the students leaving that appeared to be more serious to you practically the same yeah, it was like they went, when the more serious students came by, <clears throat> the announcement went on. Okay. Now, when you hear that announcement, what were you supposed to do? Supposed to lock down. Did you? No. What did you do? I went to check the hallways to make sure people were okay. When you first started to check the hallways, did you see anybody? It, the hallways cleared so fast. Um, when I made the turn down the 400 hallway, I ran into a teacher who was locking his door. And then a student came up who was running late. He asked if it was a drill. I don't know that it didn't matter if it was a drill or not. Just you got to get covered okay. in there. Um, and then I proceeded down the hallway. I was the only one in the hallway at that point. Did you hear anything? First, I smelled something. I smelled what I thought was cap gun. Okay. Later, figured out it was gunpowder. Um, and then I heard two, two gunshots. Where were you when you first smelled what you thought to be cap gun? Probably by like the, the somewhere between 409 and 414. <clears throat> So you were continuing to walk down that hallway, the 400 hallway, towards the 200 hallway? That's the yellow highlight? Yes, that's where I heard the gunshots. I was going that direction. You were walking towards the gunshots? Yep. Yes. As you walked down the hallway, did you see anybody else? No. Tell me where you went. When I got to the end of the hallway, I went, I realized how dumb this is. I turned left to go towards where I heard the gunshots. So this hallway. And I went towards 225. So you came down the 400 hallway and you turned left towards 225. Yes. Tell us what you saw when you made a left. I saw a student laying on the ground. Do you know who he was? 
I didn't at that time, no. Okay. Um, his face was covered. And then as I continued a couple of steps, I could see another student walking my direction. He had just dropped his, his arm was up and then he dropped his arm. Did you recognize him? Not at that point, no. He was too far away. What did you do when you saw a student on the ground? I, there was a garbage can between he and I, so I moved the garbage can out of the way and I put my foot near him and nudged him and told him to stay there. Did he respond? No. Could you tell if he was injured at that point? Um, you could tell he was injured. What happened next? Uh, Ethan then came into a closer view and I could tell it was Ethan. He, he had been at the school where you were principal? Yes. Did you interact with him at all at Oxford High School? Just normal, like how I interact with everybody. High fives, hugs, silly stuff that I do. Okay. Um, I brought my elementary to the high school, you know, so I just... Did you, did you say anything to him? When he got close enough to me that I could, I mean, we were sharing the hallway, so he was kind of walking down the center and I was kind of over to the side, so that's, we're probably what, three feet apart. I um, asked him if he's okay, it just didn't seem right that it would be him. He just. So I need to back up just a little bit. When you saw, you didn't know who it was at first, the student down the hallway, you said he had lowered his arm. I knew it was a shooter when he was down the hallway. Okay. Could you see if he was holding anything? I could see a gun. At that point, were you, was he walking towards you or away from you? He's walking towards me. It was when I realized it was Ethan that I didn't think he could possibly be the shooter is what happened. But like, I know I said I knew it was a shooter down there because I could see, I could rationalize that that is a gun. He is putting that gun down. He just shot something. Okay. Now, I know this is difficult, but I need you to use your teacher voice and speak. Okay. Loud as you can. Thank you. You saw him coming towards you. How close, how far from, from him were you when you recognized who it was? He was probably um, by the room 221 um, when I could tell who he was. Okay. And I was standing. Um, between, well, between 226 and, and, uh, that white section there that, yeah, there's exit doors there. Now, you, you said you said something to him? Yeah, I, I, it seems so odd that it was him. So I said, buddy, are you okay? What's going on? And when he didn't respond to me and he looked away. That's when I knew it was him, that he was the shooter. Did he point the gun at you? He did not. What did you do at that point? I got on the walkie and I told, um, I told my team that I have eyes on a shooter and I have a victim. Now this hallway, <laughs> 200 hallway, there's a curve to it. Yeah, yes. Okay. If he was walking, if we followed the mouse cursor here, he was walking down the 200 hallway towards 233 and 237? Yeah, he was walking that direction. That direction? Yes. Did you watch where he went? No. What did you do? There was a student who was injured, so I went to him. I didn't, <coughs> I knew he needed And um, I know you're aware, but there's been certain uh, rulings by the court, so. Just in general terms, did you render aid to that student? I did. Could you tell if he was injured at that point? Yes. Did you recognize him? Yeah, I knew another one of my students from Lakeville. <coughs> Tate Mir. Just took my breath away. Were you, uh, you were on the walkie-talkie, you said? Yes. Okay. 
So I let them know I had, I let them know I had eyes on the shooter and that I had a victim. Kurt News asked me where I was. It's probably the biggest hallway we have. And I said I was in the 200 hallway. Kurt let me know if that's a very big hallway and needed more direction. I, um, I don't know why I couldn't process the fact that like my exact location, I told him I was near the 400. Okay. Did you stay with Tate until help arrived? Yes. Now you have seen at least a portion of the Oxford High School surveillance video, is that right? Yes. I'm going to show you what's been marked as people's nine has been admitted. It cannot be broadcast on the media. Oh, all of it? I, I've never seen it, so you have to tell me. Oh, the entire, this is a, um, a short clip of it. None of it can be <laughs> Okay. You, you have, okay, so you're not, you guys are not video, okay. Everybody gets it? No. You're going to stop the live stream? Should we stop the live stream? Yes. Yes, sir. Yes, please. Okay. All right. I do want to give notice to jury. All right, so we're going to stop the live stream apparently while they're doing this video just to save the problem. So this apparently is just some surveillance footage from inside the school, which involves minors. And so they're preventing display of that for that reason, because it depicts minors. So obviously the jury gets to see it, so it doesn't impact the case. It just impacts what we get to see. But you know what you you know exactly what it is without seeing it. Of course you do. You know, you know exactly what this video shows. I mean, you don't actually, you don't get to see the horror of it, but you know exactly what this shows. This shows students bleeding, wounded, mortally. This person apparently caring for this child. I, I, I understand that the child died in her arms. So you get to see that horror show. So, you know, we, we understand what we're talking about. So we're not really... We're missing the sensationalism of it, but we, we know what the video depicts without seeing it. So. Can I give my opinion on the school's culpability that day? Um, I think if the parents are responsible, there's a pretty decent argument to say that someone at the school, someone at the school might also be responsible under the same theory. So I think you could, I think there's a reasonable case to be made that if you can charge the parents, you can also charge someone at the school. And so there's that. There's some cold, cold people in this chat. Well, there might be cold people in that chat, this chat. I, I don't necessarily mind people who are analytical about the thing. So non-emotionality isn't necessarily a bad trait. I tend to try to look at things in a more analytical frame. So, you know, but even I have feelings and sometimes things get to me. I am human. Prejudicial versus probative. I don't think it's substantially more prejudicial than probative because, again, you do have to prove you have to prove everything again because this is a new trial involving new people. So you have to prove everything again. You can't, for the sake of this trial, take official notice that Ethan Crumbly did anything because these people have an independent right to have that challenged or not. And so the state the state must prove the state must prove once again that Ethan Crumbly committed the school shooting because it now relates to these people on a different case. So to show some of this seems appropriate, and then you're just in a dividing line question of how much is too much. But without seeing like the, the footage directly, I'm unable to offer an opinion. But it, it seems like it would depend probably on how much video we show and how, how much we do this. But it probably, it's probably more, it's probably not substantially more prejudicial than probative. Detroit NBC2 is staying live. Okay, let me check. Um, let 
Where? NBC2 News and... Wait, Detroit? Well, I'm in Florida. Detroit NBC2. Oh, Fox 2 Detroit? No, that's not the one you want. Builders? I hate having to do things like this live. It looks so sloppy and unprofessional. I'd hate having to do things like this live. It makes me feel like an ass. Um, I'm sorry. Is, is the prosecution further question? I, yes. I'm sorry. I really can't think straight. Oh, yeah. I, I think he said that he's finished. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I, I, I couldn't find your feed. I'm sorry. I have no questions for you. I'm sorry. Thank you. Thank you. Can you spend a space? Yes, you can step down and work space. Who's an ex witness? It's Candy Bat. You're the only professional here. What do I, what the hell do we care? I care. I care because it makes me look unprofessional. I hate having to do things on the fly in the middle of a live stream. I hate having to try to, to fix streams or change streams or hunt for things in the middle of a live stream. Because if I can't find it right away, it makes me look incompetent, it makes me look bad, and it, it's, bad TV, it's bad TV. It's just fundamentally bad TV. Because you're seeing me futz around rather than seeing stuff. It, it causes people to click off. It causes all kinds of things. It makes me look bad. I hate having to find things on the fly during a live stream. And people say things like this, and I'm like, oh, I can't find it right away, and it makes me look like an ass. I hate it. It makes me look unprofessional. Stop, you're missing the courtroom. Fuck you. Anyone else have any comments? The prosecutors, not to show emotion. You instructed the prosecutors to tell our witnesses not to show emotion. Well, and you instructed I us to tell that's our what victims. No. I don't think that's actually what I I said. understand the ruling, Your Honor. I yeah. do. You're concerned about influence of the jury. That's right. Oh, yeah. I, I think he said that he's, that he's yes. finished. Yeah. Okay. Um, I, I have no questions for you. I'm sorry. Thank you. Thank you. Can you spend a space? Yes, you can step Well, apparently the video was very upsetting. Say it again. I'm, I'm like so sorry. Can we just have a minute, like a break, or a, can we have a ten minute break, please? Sure. Sure. Let me give you a ten minute break, okay? All right, for the jury. I'm not necessarily sure. I'm not necessarily sure that her own defense attorney crying isn't necessarily bad for her, because to show that you feel something might actually be good. I don't know. So it probably wouldn't be the way that I would go, but maybe it's the right way to go. I don't know. So are we still on break? Lawyer, sit there. This court upon the defense's um, request, instructed. All right, let's watch whatever this is. Okay. You are on the record. Mm -hmm. And you are. Um, this court, upon the defense's um, request, instructed the prosecutors not to show emotion. You instructed the prosecutors 
to tell our witnesses not to show emotion. Well, and you instructed us to tell our victims. I, no. I don't think that's actually what I, I said. understand the ruling, Your Honor. I yeah. do. You're concerned about influence of the jury. I, yeah. I, have, I take no issue with it. But it was a difficult thing. It's difficult, and we're doing it. And then to have not just the defendant, her lawyer sit there sobbing. So I, that, I did not I, sob. I just, I just want to finish, Your Honor. I just want to finish. I, I just, I, I think if, if that is the instruction, we are trying really hard to respect the court's instruction because I understand the reason for it. Okay, I didn't tell people not to show emotion. I, I some of that is involuntary, um, but there there have been times in this courtroom during trials when people will show facial expressions or they'll or you know things like that or, or make comments. I understand this is a very emotional situation for everyone here, right? I if someone was audibly sobbing in the the audience, I would hope that they would exit. I, and as you said, you know, the reason for it, I didn't tell anybody not to, to show emotion. I, I guess some emotion is involuntary. So I, I guess I'm, I'm asking what you're asking of me. I just, I think it just, it, it, it should apply to both, both sides. Oh, Your Honor, first of all, I was not sobbing. And this is horrific. This I've is never, horrific. I've never seen this before. It's okay. horrific. That's okay. why we asked the court not to play it. I. This is horrific. I don't know how but, the press okay, this is. She's watched it a hundred times with these it. witnesses. You've it's it. horrific. You've, you've had the, you've had this video you've, for two over two years. I don't know. I don't have this video. I have to go to their office to watch it. And I. You've seen it. This no, I I haven't because it's not necessary. It's not relevant to my client's case. We've already litigated this, but we're we're doing our best. We were not sobbing or making a scene in any way all my eye makeup still on i checked my camera i'm not gonna i'm not i'm not having i need to run to the bathroom i need a break okay okay we're having a break that's what we're doing and you gotta keep your voices down because i'm sorry the, well, I, the the walls are cardboard in here so i'm sorry okay all right everyone's everyone here is human right everyone here is human i understand that i just i i'm i'm striving really hard to to give both sides a fair trial and if uh, if people don't at least try to check themselves to exit if it's um that excruciating which i know it is i you know i'm not a robot i'm trying to keep myself from sobbing i'll do it at six o'clock tonight okay i appreciate uh, that your honor that's all i'm asking okay all your honor, we don't have the option to leave the courtroom we're trying our best we're trying i promise okay. you we're trying our best okay. all right thank all right. you everybody needs to take a deep breath she has to go downstairs, right? And um, we're going to call you right, have, have a come, right? How, how long do you think the next witness is? I'm, you know, I'm, I'm bringing lunch in for the next jurors. witnesses can be back. I anticipate very brief questioning. Okay, because I'm, I'm having the lunch, their lunch delivered so they don't have to commingle with people in the cafeteria. It, it should be less than 30 minutes. So okay, we'll okay. all right. Are we going to okay. break then after that witness? Yes. Okay, thank you. Yes. Great. I apologize. No, I, it, it's it, it's natural. It's horrifying. It's, it's, it's horrifying. It, it is horrifying. I, but I, you know, we're trying. We're I, trying. I, okay. We'll keep trying. So she had to go All to the right. prosecutor's office to view the video. That seems a little bit weird. Yeah, she had to go to the prosecutor's office to see the video. She she wasn't given a copy of it for herself to see in her own office. That doesn't seem. That seems pretty restrictive. To be fair yeah all right so we're on a break we're on a break yeah let's see if i can figure out how to get the zoom feed directly while we're on break so let's see All right, let's see. Okay, hold on. So let me see if I can get this directly from uh, the court. Uh, shit. Um, Uh, 
Okay, this is the right one. All right, let me do this, click this. Let me see if I can get this feed up. So we'll get the best quality feed we possibly can for you guys. All right. Recording in progress. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Okay. Now, how do I actually get this to work? Where is it? Uh, where's system preferences? Damn it. Video, do that, do that. Shit. I hate having to do this live. It makes me look like an ass. I want to always give you nothing but the best. And when I can't do that, it makes me very, very frustrated. Okay. All right. It looks like I got it. Great. All right. So I have direct feed from the court now. Cool. Okay, I need to, this is really hard to see this delineation. I think this is right. Oops, I don't know if that looks, I can't see it. I can't quite see what's going on. Uh, we'll have to adjust it when the, we'll have to adjust the framing when the court comes back. But we'll go from there. Video. General. Dark theme. Video. Audio. Share screen. Test chat. Zoom apps. Recording. Profile. How do I change the incoming feeds quality? That's a good question on, 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 on Zoom. Um, advanced settings. Video render. Okay, video post-processing, video capture. Can you change the quality of a Zoom? Can you change the quality of the Zoom thing? So that you get a better quality feed, is that a thing? I don't, I'm not used to using Zoom, so I ask. Can you control like the resolution of the Zoom thing? Is that a thing? <sighs> no one knows in chat? Okay. All right, so we'll we'll deal with what we got. And go from there. Cool. Yeah, you guys are welcome. I I, I want to cover the case because it's legally interesting. It's factually interesting. It's interesting on a whole number of levels. The the facts as it relates specifically to the parents' knowledge. Right. So so far we just had a background as to what Ethan did. So we don't really have anything that really implicates the parents. But as I said again, we have to prove that the school shooting happened because we're in a new case. So these we have to prove everything again. All right, so we have to prove the school shooting occurred. You know, so yeah. So we got, you know, a teacher who was shot. We got an assistant principal who had someone die in their arms. We got to show the thing occurred. And then we'll, then we'll get to 
presumably we'll get to evidence that implicates the mother specifically because they're being charged separately at this point. Did I see the attorney flipped off defense? I don't know that's what happened. I'm going to give some gratitude to people. It's difficult for everyone. I'm not sure that's what happened. And I'm not going to go back and rewatch the tape before someone asks. You think that's what happened? Cool. I'm just, let's move on with it. You know what I mean? What else can I ask? What else can I answer for you in, in the interim? I, I certainly don't have any objection to the defense asking for a break. You know, it is a little weird to my mind that the tapes apparently were not given to the defense directly. They had to go to the prosecutor's office to have it. Why does the prosecutor's office get to have a copy and they don't have their own copy? Seems a little odd, but you'd have to go back into the, you know, discovery disputes on that kind of thing and figure out what the court was thinking. So we'll move on with the moment. Where are the charges? Read the description, baby. Read the video description. You have failed. You have failed to check the video description before asking the chat. Lol. No, that's not what the judge said. She said, yeah, well, the judge said you had it for two years. And then the defense is like, no, we didn't. We had to go to the prosecutor's office. And then she's like, well, you had the opportunity to view him. So the, she actually corrected the judge, and then the judge corrected what she said. So, yeah. ab seven Chicago live feed showed it all. Well, I mean... Fine, we'll go check if it's another... We'll check another source and see if that will help us even better. So maybe they have cameras and they have their own feed. So they, they stop the live feed. So live law and crime is just using the feed and ABC seven has their own feed and they're just they're So they're looking at separately. Yeah, that could be, let me see if I can find them on, so we can use their source. Link in the mod chat. Okay. Let's go to the mod chat. Detroit 7. Okay. I love the kids, so just bringing energy and having fun with them. All right, cool. All right, so we have a better feed still. Cool. So we have something even better than the webinar feed. Cool. All right, give me a second. Give me a second and we'll go back to the part we missed. See if we can see if we can cram it in in the time we have remaining. Well, I suppose we don't strictly speaking have to because we can just go back to live whenever we're done. Uh, let's see. Okay, so let me make this look pretty. Okay going to be like about here and there's the edge look about here there's the edge okay that looks good all right okay make that look pretty great all right so let's see what part we missed prior up until this role you were an elementary school principal so the, this um, one showed some actual like images. Passage and oh, they actually showed exhibits and stuff. Like kind of oh, this is much better. Okay. This is much better. Is that something, something you would do on a routine basis? So, please, when I, when I stepped aside, that's when I said... Okay, Christy, tell us when we see you. I let them know I had... I let them know I had... He's down the hallway. Okay. Could you see if he was holding anything? I could see a gun. At that point, were you 
Was he walking towards you or away from you? He's walking towards me. It was when I realized it was Ethan that I didn't think he could possibly be the shooter is what happened. I think I know I said that I knew he was a shooter down there because I could see, I could rationalize that that is a gun. He is putting that gun down. He just shot something. Okay. Now, I know this is difficult, but I need you to use your teacher voice and, and speak. Okay. Well, we Thank you. you saw him coming towards you. How close, how far from, from him were you when you recognized who it was? He was probably um, by the deaths. Yeah, yes. Render eight. Students from Lakeville. <coughs> I have never seen it so to oh, The entire, this is a, um, a short clip of it. Now that I can hear it. Okay, so you guys are not video recording everybody gets it? We're going to stop the last stream? Should we stop the last stream? Yes. Yes, Jeff. Okay. Yes, please. Okay. Right. I, I do want to give notice to the jury as well. This is the moving image of a, a victim on this video. Okay. Christy, tell us when we see you. I am approaching right in the yellow jacket there, the gold jacket. Okay. For the record, this is at 12.51 p.m. on November the 30th. So no one's come by at this point? No. That's that's when he came by. He said, get the hell out of here. I don't know if you could see him okay. running through there. The first student? You see more students running. These kids are kind of laughing, and then you'll see me stopping. There we go. And there's my walkie. And you're walking down the and middle I'm hallway there? walking towards the direction that the kids told me. <laughs> they cleared the hallways very, very, very fast. you at the top of the screen? Yes. I didn't realize that we passed there. This is where the teacher came out. I'm checking another classroom to make sure they were okay. And then I'm continuing on. This is where I'm saying, that's when I, when I stepped aside, that's when I said I, I had eyes on the shooter because he flinched a little bit, at least my perception that he did. This is where <laughs> I moved the garbage can. Around. That's, that's tape. When I'm talking on the walkie, I try to s step back a little bit because I think it, I don't know, I think it threw Ethan off a little. And so there he is coming up to me. And I start talking to him here. And I'm letting them know that I have a victim and I have a shooter. I'm asking them questions. I turned my back on him and I came back to Tate because I just, I didn't know it was Tate then. And then I, that's what right there is when I know it's Tate. This 
actually after the police arrive on scene, we've cut portions of it. Yeah. So, police arrived on scene, and they were trying to figure out his name. The shooter's name? Yes, and so I left Tate to go tell them who it was, and then I went right back to Tate. I did not want to be away from Tate. I, I was telling Ken, his name's Ethan. Thank you for your statement. Um, we're going to have cross. Uh, uh, you can resume, they can resume the live stream, right? Okay. All right, so that's the portion we missed. And then we'll go back to live, quasi live at least. All right, so. Okay, we're just gonna, we're just like a minute behind, no big deal. Good morning. Good morning. Do you swear and affirm the testimony that you have to do this? Of course, I'll help you that. Okay. You can be seated, and then the new statement for the record is spelled first and last name. Cammy Back. And spell your first and last name, please. C A M M Y B A C K. Go ahead, Pastor. Thank you. Ms. Back, I'm going to ask you to keep your voice nice and loud for me, okay? Okay. Now, is it true, Miss, that you work at a retail store that sells firearms? Yes. And that's in Oxford, Michigan? Yes. Okay. Um, how long have you worked there? Uh, four years. What's your current title? Uh, office manager. Have you always been the office manager? No. As office manager, um, do you assist with gun sales? Yes, I do. Okay. And what did you do before you became the office manager? I was a counter. I'm sorry? I worked the counter. Okay, the counter? Yes. Okay, so you would deal with customers? Yes. And you're familiar with the procedure when someone um, purchases a firearm? Yes. Okay. <clears throat> now, there is a specific process when somebody purchases a handgun, is that correct? Yes. Could you tell us a little bit about that, please? So, when you come in to purchase a firearm, whether it's um, a handgun or a long gun, um, we have to have your ID. Um, you have to fill out a 4473. What's that? Um, it's a federal firearms form for okay. the customer. Um, once that is done, um, myself or whoever will run a NICS check um, on the computer. Okay, can you tell us what that is? That is where you send it over to... Um, I just lost my train of thought. Uh, <laughs> uh, to the FBI, and okay. then they take it from there. Okay. Do you know what happens with that? When I do not. The FBI? Right. Nope. So you take this information in, and the uh, customer fills out certain forms, and you send that off. Yes. Okay. And how long does that process usually take? Um, sometimes it could take seconds. Sometimes it could take up to thirty minutes. Okay. Or longer. Is someone able to walk in and buy a firearm, or to buy a firearm and walk out with that gun purchase that day? As long as they pass the background check. As long as everything checks out? Yes. Now what happens if things um, don't check out, or if there's some kind of delay? Does that ever happen? Yes. Okay, and tell me about that. So, um, if a customer is delayed, uh, you we are giving them a Brady date, which is five days. Um, within those five days, um, the next check could come back as a perceived or it could come back as a denied. Um, after five days, if there's no response, then we are allowed to um, hand the firearm over to the customer. Okay. Do you know the circumstances in the background why somebody might be approved or denied? I do not. Okay. Now, when the store you work at sells a firearm, do you also provide a ATF pamphlet on handgun safety? Yes. Is that with every handgun purchase? With every handgun, yes. Okay. And tell me about that pamphlet, please. What kind of information is contained in there? Um, it just states um, the do's and the don'ts um, as far as, you know, when you buy a firearm, child safety, um, how to lock it, um, just to pretty much keep your firearm safe and out of the hands of, you know, anyone that doesn't need to have it. Okay. And that is uh, provided by the ATF? Yes. Okay. That's the, Al the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms? Yes. All right. Does your store also provide a trigger lock statement? 
Yes. Okay. And is that one of the standard forms that has to come with the firearms purchase? Yes. Okay. And tell me what that is, please. So it's just um, the trigger um, lock form. Um, we take and we make sure we check the box that it has the lock in the box and that it has a a box that can be locked. Okay. Now we see the lock in the box. What do you mean by that? The trigger lock. Okay. So when your store sells a firearm, you also provide a, a lock with it? Yes. Okay. And that's not an actual gun safe, correct? That's that's a smaller locking device? Yes. All right. Um, and that happens with every um, handgun sale from your store? Yes. I'd like to direct your attention to November the 26th of 2021. Do you remember that day? I do. Okay. And were you working? Yes, I was. Did you, well, first of all, I should ask you, as office manager and someone who's been employed at the store for four years, every time a firearm is sold, is your receipt kept? Yes. Okay. Um, on November the 26th, 2021, did you sell a handgun to James Crumpton? I did. Okay. And was he there with somebody else? during that purchase? Yes, he was. Okay, was it an adult or was it a teenager? Teenager. Okay. Did you come to learn who that person was? Later, yes. Okay, and, and you came to learn that it was the defendant's 15-year-old son? Yes, sir. Okay. But you didn't know that at the time? No, I did not. Okay. Now, during the purchase uh, between yourself and James Crumley, did his son do anything? Never. Okay, so he was there, present, but he didn't interact with you? No. I'd like to direct your attention also to June the 15th, 2021, um, did James Crumbly make another purchase of a fire on that day? That I cannot say. Okay. If I showed you receipts, um, would that refresh your memory, you think? Yes. Okay. So what I'm going to do is go through some exhibits with you. They'll be on the screen in front of you. These oh. are all stipulated, too. Can you see that? Yes. Okay. This is exhibit 24. This is, do you recognize this is a receipt from the store you work at? Yes. Okay. This is June the 15th, 2021. Do you see the date? Yes. All right. And the purchaser is James Robert Crumbly? Yes. And it has his address. And it has the item uh, purchase. And that's a Cobra Classic for $180 total. Yes. And that's actually a, a 22 Derringer pistol. Is that correct? Yes. 24 has been admitted, I believe, with stipulation. Um, I, I believe that Ms. Smith was willing to uh, stipulate to 24 for 30. Is that accurate? That's correct. 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, and 30 are admitted. So, okay. Thank you, Judge. This is exhibit 25 right here. It says pistol sales record. Can you tell us about that, please? So, each time that a pistol is sold, we have to uh, provide the customer with a pistol record. Um, they, they are given those and they are instructed to have those dropped within 10 days of the purchase. Okay. Now, this has a description of the pistol, is that right? Yes. So it says, this is the Cobra Classic, we just saw the receipt for. Mm -hmm. Do you see that on there? Yes. Okay, and it says pistol shot. And the number two, what does that mean? It's a two shot. Okay, so it's a small handgun? Yes. And barrel length 2.25, is that in inches? Yes. Okay. It says purchase transfer date is June the 16th of 2021, whereas the receipt is June the 15th, 2021. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us what happened there? So um, I believe that Mr. Crombley may have gotten a delay on June 15th, and he had a proceed either later in the day on June 15th, or he may have gotten a proceed early morning on June 16th. Okay, and that's because there's some kind of delay in the background information? Yes. Um, Ms. Mack, is it true that some handguns sold by the store actually come with their own cable locks, not just from the retailer themselves? Yes. Okay, so, Whereas in, on, on uh, November the 26th, you provided a, uh, a lock. Not every handgun has to be provided a lock by your store. Yes, it does. Because the manufacturer gives the lock themselves. Yes. Okay. So I don't think that was clear, so I just want to back up for a second. So uh, some guns that come in from the manufacturer, the manufacturer do not 
provide locks. Okay. We have to provide those. Got I'm it. sorry. Okay, no, that's okay. <laughs> okay. No, that's my fault, not yours. Okay. The um, six hour, for example, they do not provide their own locks, is that right? Some they do, some they do not. Okay, and if they don't, then you would fill in that gap? Yes. All right. Now this is exhibit 26. This is a receipt, James Robert Crumbly, June the 16th. And this is the Caltech P17 22LR, total price $349. Do you see that? Yes. Okay, this is exhibit 26. And again, this is June the 16th. That's the day that he would have received the Deringer. Yes. You're right? Okay. And here's exhibit 27, which is the actual pistol sales record. And again, purchase transfer date June 7th. Caltech. 21. So there's a P17 and 22 well. caliber. Okay. And this All description right. is it's a 16 shot, barrel length is 3.8 inches. Yes. So it is, it's bigger than the Derringer. Yes. Now moving on to Caltech makes a really cool shotgun. From November the 26th. They have a double, they have a double um, magazine. So they have eight plus eight plus one, I think. So you can actually like select which magazine it is. And so you can do a 17 shot shotgun. Kick ass. Yes. Do you recall if his son was with him in June? Or did you not complete that purchase? I did not complete that purchase. Okay, that's fair. But as office manager, you can tell us that those records are from your store. Yes. Okay. Here's exhibit 29. This is the pistol sales record. And this is from the Sig Sauer on November 26th, is that right? Yes. Okay, so this is a 15 shot and it's 3.75 inch barrel. Yes. Is that right? Okay. And he walked out with that gun on November the 26th, 2021. Is that the date that we have right there? Yes. Okay. Now, hypothetically speaking, if there is a 15-year-old who walked in your store and tried to buy a handgun, would you let him? Absolutely not. Okay, that would be illegal, right? Yes. Okay. Here's Exhibit 30. This is a portion of the financial, of the firearms transaction record. I think you referred to it as a 4473. Do you recognize this? Yes. Okay. And was this provided? This was filled out by James Crumlin? Yes. Okay. And what's the purpose of this form here? That is to keep a record for ATF for all firearms that are sold. So there's certain certain boxes are checked here. And the condition of the gun is notified. In this case, it was it was used. Yes. Okay. Um, and the purchaser has to assert certain things before he can he can walk out with that with that gun. Is that is that right? Yes. In one of those boxes, are are you the actual transferee, or, or you are the actual buyer of the gun? It's not for somebody else. Right. Because it is not legal for someone to buy a gun for somebody else through your store. Correct. No, it is. Well, that person has to come in and, and uh, fill out this paperwork. That yes. Right? right. So it would not be legal for a adult, for example, to check this box that the gun is for himself and then transfer it to a child. Yes. Does she actually know that for a fact? Because she's speaking to a legal issue. Can you dip, tell us the difference between cable lock and a trigger? I might object to that question, to be honest. So a cable lock... Um, Objection calls for a legal conclusion outside of her experience. Of ...and run the cable through yeah. the barrel and bring it out and to lock. Trigger lock goes directly on the trigger. Okay. And do you recall what was provided to James Trembley in June on, on November the 26th? I believe it was a cable lock. A cable lock. Okay. So it looks like a rope. Yes. And then at the end of the rope, there is a, a locking mechanism? Yes. And then that's um, fastened by a key, would that be right? Correct, yes. Okay. There's some firearms that can't be secured with the cable lock versus trigger lock, or is it unique to certain guns that you need one versus the other? I don't believe so. Okay. Does your store always 
provide either a cable lock or a trigger lock, or does it depend? They, we provide both. Both. Yes. Okay. But on this particular occasion, on November of 2021, it was a cable lock. It was a cable lock, yes. I have nothing for it. Oh, hang on one second. Thank you, Judge. Nothing for it. Um, thank you, Your Honor. Um, I just want to go back through the exhibits. Would the easiest if I had the prosecution go back through them if I ask, or is it easier if I just transfer it to my laptop? Okay. Very easy. Okay. Um, can you put up exhibit number 24, please? Just so that the jury can see it. And if you want, I can put it on my computer. I have them. Oh, we have another flash drive, don't we? I, yeah. I have them on my computer. Do you want me to take the reins and use my laptop? Yes. yes. Okay. Um, Your Honor, we just need to switch this over then. Oh, gosh. Hit that button, and then I've got to plug in my... This feels a little... She doesn't feel quite as smooth, does she? It feels... I don't know. It just feels... Yeah, I don't know. I, I'm, not, I'm not having the warmest feelings from this attorney I've ever had in my life. And if I ask anything confusing, can you please just slow me down and let me know? Sure. Okay, thank you. It's not my job to confuse you. I want to make sure you understand each question I ask. Okay. Um, the first exhibit the prosecution showed, Exhibit 24, which was admitted, is a receipt for a Derringer gun. And I just want to be clear that Derringer gun was purchased by James Crumbly, correct? I cannot say. If you look at the receipt. By the receipt, yes. Okay, so by the receipt, it indicates James Crumbly purchased the weapon. Mm -hmm. and it's, yes. Yes. yes, I'm sorry. And it's fair to say that Jennifer Crumbly's name does not appear anywhere on that receipt. No. We went, we talked about exhibit 25, the pistol sales record. Um, and this was the uh, pistol that was bought back in June of 2021. On this receipt, or I'm sorry, on this pistol sales record, James Crumbly is the person who purchased this pistol. Is that correct? Yes. Jennifer Crumbly's name does not appear anywhere on this pistol sales receipt, correct? No. I'm sorry? No. Thank you. Okay, I like this. This is fine. Little 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 fuss in the right. transfer, Exhibit but the questions are good. Exhibit 26 was admitted. This is a receipt from a Caltech gun that was purchased, correct? Yes. And again, on this receipt, it indicates that James Robert Crumbly purchased the gun. Yes. And J Jennifer Crumbly's name does not appear anywhere on that receipt. No. <laughs> yeah, the spikes on the clock, it must be some state thing. I don't know. Because they're like different right, levels of to height to represent the sun or something. I don't know what's this going is on the there. Pistol sales receipt from the Caltech that we just talked about in the, in the prior receipt. I'm sorry, this is the sales record. The sales record indicates James Crumbly bought this, this gun. Yes. Okay, and Jennifer Crumbly's name is not listed as the purchaser or she's not anywhere on this record, correct? Yes. All right, I'm going to number 28, which has been admitted. This is the receipt 
from the Sig Sauer that was purchased in November of 2021, correct? Yes. You have a direct memory of the purchase on the Sig Sauer gun, correct? Yes. And on this receipt, this gun was purchased by James Crumbly, correct? Yes. The receipt does not have Jennifer Crumbly's name. No. And when this gun was purchased, James Crumbly was accompanied by a teenage boy and no one else, correct? Correct. And you were testifying that um, you didn't have any interactions with the teenage boy who was with Mr. Crumbly. Correct. And when you saw this teenage boy with Mr. Crumbly, there was nothing about him that stood out to you as unusual or weird or something that would have raised concern about selling the gun to James Crumbly with his son, correct? No. I'm sorry, there, the court's making a record, so it's, it's really important we talk one at a time. I, I'm not trying to cut you off in any way. I just need to make sure the record's really clear. Sure. So I'm just gonna re-ask, and I'm, I'm doing it just to have a clear record. When, when you saw Ethan Crumbly with Mr. Crumbly buying the gun, there was nothing about him that concerned you about selling the weapon to Mr. Crumbly, correct? Correct. And on that date, you vividly remember it was only the two of them at the gun store purchasing that weapon, correct? Correct. There you go, counselor. Get that in, baby. Get that in. And again, on Exhibit 29, this is the pistol sales receipt. Jennifer Nick Crumbly's name does not appear anywhere on the pistol sales receipt, correct? Correct. And I'm gonna open Exhibit 30, which has been admitted. This is the firearms transaction receipt. This is specific to the November gun that was purchased, the Sig Sauer, correct? Yes. And on this form, James Crumbly is the only adult that filled out this form, correct? Yes. Jennifer Crumbly's name does not appear anywhere on this form. No. And the information provided um, was all provided by James Crumbly, correct? Correct. And you cannot sell a weapon to a 15-year-old who walks into your store if they came in and wanted to buy a gun, correct? Correct. And if you don't know the answers to these questions, I can ask someone else, but I'm gonna ask you, um, when a parent buys a gun, um, you have, a parent has a right to take their child to a shooting range, correct? Yes. A parent has a right to take their child hunting, correct? Yes. A parent has a right, when they own a gun, to allow their child to use the gun at things like a gun range or hunting or along those lines, correct? Yes. Good job. Good job, counselor. Good questions. You testified that with the Sig Sauer gun, it did not come from the manufacturer with a lock, correct? A cable lock. That was a used gun. Okay, so the used gun did not come with a cable lock in the case, correct? It may have. If it didn't, you provided a cable lock yes. to that gun. Yes. And in order to take a cable lock off a gun, you have to use a key, correct? Yes. And the key is, it's not just any key, it's a key specific to that cable lock, correct? Yes. And in Michigan, there is no, as far as you know, and if you don't know, you can tell me and I can ask another witness, 
there is no requirement that a person has to store a gun in a safe, correct? Judge, I'm going to object. That's calling for legal conclusion. Well, it, 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 it is. It, it is calling for legal conclusion. I'm, I'm, I'm assuming you guys could stipulate to that at some point. Either way, is that appropriate for this or, party? Yeah. Okay, we'll, we'll yeah, take care of that later. Sir. Yeah. Okay. Um, when you sell guns to people at your store, you also, um, you do not, you're not required to also sell them a safe for that gun, correct? Correct. As a precaution, if it does not come with a cable lock, you make sure that every gun that leaves your store is sent out with a cable lock if one can be put on that gun, correct? Cable lock or trigger lock. Or trigger lock. Yes. Okay, thank you. I have no there objection to these questions. These are good. Time that you recall seeing Mrs. Crumbly at the store looking at guns, considering buying a gun, anything along those lines, correct? Correct. And of course, I don't expect your memory's perfect. I'm just asking by recollection, you don't recall that Mrs. Crumbly was in there? She was not, no. It's also not illegal for a father to bring children in or a teenager in with them to purchase a weapon, correct? Correct. Mr. Crumbly is not the only person who has ever been in the store purchasing a weapon with minors present, correct? Correct. And there is nothing that when you come to the door of the store that says minors cannot enter the store or, or look at what, what you have in terms of your stock, correct? Correct. May I have just a minute? Sure. Okay. Right, these questions are fine. The, the, the lawyer the lawyer is growing in my esteem a little bit. He's I have no further questions. Thank you. Good job. Just Good job. Ms. Mack, I'm just going to clear a few things up. I'm afraid I wasn't terribly clear. These sure. things. Um, first of all, after the shooting in Oxford High School, agents from the ATF, they came and spoke with you. Would that be right? Yes. Okay. And ATF, that's the government agency that sort of regulates the finance or the firearms transactions. Yes. Okay, at least to your understanding. Yes. Okay. And when you, well, first of all, let me ask you this. Do you recall on November the 26th when that Sig Sauer was sold to James Crumbly, if he shopped around at all or if he went right to that gun? He went right to that gun. And did he make any statements about that? That he had had his eye on for some time. I would object to the hearsay of the uh, co-defendant who's not present in this trial. It's not offered for the truth of the matter, sir, the judge. It's offered to show that he went right for that gun. Well, I guess he, he asked whether or not he uh, looked around. He didn't, he didn't look at anything else. No, ma'am. Thank you, Judge. And um, were you able to tell if um, that transaction for the SIG Sauer on 11-26-21 was for cash or for credit? It was cash. Cash, okay. And you did that by comparing the receipts on November the 26th, and there were no credit or check transactions that have been made in the amount of $519.35. Correct. Okay. Thank you, Nelson. Can I ask you, there's also an Exhibit 31. Oh, that's going to come through Agent Brandon. Okay, I just wanted to make sure you didn't have to uh, bring this up the stack. Um, I'm going to excuse her. Thank you. Thank you, Judge. Yeah, that was good. No, no problems on that. On the defense, defense did fine. Showing her, showing this client had nothing to do with buying the gun. No objections there. Maybe, def maybe defense lawyer showing up for the party finally. Why do you pay cash? Who cares? Who cares? I mean, I, I'm not sure why it matters one way or another. Who cares?
come back. To, we'll come back at about. Um, you can return to the jury room at ten o'clock when your lunches are in the jury room. Um, don't discuss the case with anybody. Don't do any research. Don't go on Facebook. Don't. Uh, Ten after one? On is that uh, two hours from now? In Michigan? The time zone is Michigan now. <laughs> Michigan's Eastern Time. Okay, so that's uh, an hour from now. All right, so that will that will conclude us for the moment. That will conclude us for a moment. So yeah, good stuff. Good stuff. So we started off basically just trying to prove the shooting happened, which you know, fair enough, in sort of how that goes because we do have to prove it because again, this is a completely new case with completely new defendants and we have to prove everything happened. So no particular objection to the way state the state started. A little bit graphic perhaps to prove that the shooting happened, but. They brought in two different witnesses, a teacher who was shot themselves to show the shooting happened, and a teacher who, or a principal rather, that had a child die in their arms, I guess, based on what we understand, to prove the shooting happened and prove that it was Ethan who did it because they saw him do it and that he had a gun in his hand. So all that, fine. And then we seem to have moved on past that. And if, if we are done with trying to prove that the shooting happened, then I appreciate the prosecutor in sort of how they're handling that and sort of not bludgeoning the point to death. I appreciate that because presumably they could call other witnesses to prove the shooting happened and call up a whole bunch of other people to prove the shooting happened. But if they're done with trying to prove the shooting happened, I appreciate their discretion. And that's a kudos to them because a lot of prosecutors would probably go too far. And so if, that, if we're done with that phase, I appreciate their discretion. All right, so we we have moved on apparently past the did the shooting occur to how did the how did he get the gun phase, and so we we called the gun dealer to the stand who seemed surprisingly ill informed about some of the aspects about gun dealerships like for example that the the form goes to the FBI as opposed to the ATF but you know okay. And seems seems to be a little bit ignorant as to other things. So you know, okay, but yeah, that's sort of that's sort of where we're we're sitting right now. And um, I I think that that's that's fine. And I do appreciate very much the. I also think the defense lawyer was wise not to cross examine either the teacher or the the assistant principal because why, right? those aren't the people she'd want to call. She'd want to call whoever was in the room with Ethan when they were having the discussions with the parents, which I don't think is either of these people. So you, there's no reason to question, question these people. These, these people are just here to prove the shooting happened. She wants to question anyone who was in the room with Ethan when they were having the discussion with their parents. So there's, I appreciate there's no particular reason to cross examine these people. Yeah, the shooting occurred. We basically concede the point, you know, so we can move on. And I did appreciate her, although she fumbled a little bit at the start with getting started on her cross-examination, her cross-examination itself was very thorough to the point she was trying to make. She got basically everything she needed from this witness and highlighting the point. And, you know, it was, it was good. She went through it piece by piece, every step of the way. She asked the question, as many ways as she could think to ask the question, was Jennifer Crumbly involved? So she broke it down into each individual component, which is a very good thing to do if you're really trying to emphasize the point, right? You don't ask the question, was Jennifer Crumbly involved? And get a no. You don't do that. What you do is you ask the question every, every, every individual way you can. So it was like, okay, as, respe as respecting to this particular document, is Jennifer Crumbly's name on it? No. Is James Crumbly's name on it? Yes. And she asked that every way. And then well, you remember the you remember when he came in to buy the gun, right? Was Jennifer Crumbly there? No. Did you ever see Jennifer Crumbly in the store? Was she ever there 
looking at guns, no. So yeah, she she asked the question every possible way to prove and emphasize that she was not involved in the gun purchase or gun selection. As far as this person knows, which is all, of course, she can testify to. I mean, the witness can only testify to what she knows, but she got everything about from this witness about what she knows. Yeah, Jennifer Crumbly was not involved. Good for her. Good for her. Yeah. I mean, that's right. She's not involved. That's a relevant factor in her defense. So, you know, fair enough. I have no objection to this. The Tucker jury is ordering lunch. They're still debating. Noted. Yeah, no noted. Uh, why can I not duplicate a stream that's already happening? She took him shook took him shooting practice. Maybe she did, but this this person wouldn't know it because she wasn't there, so she can't testify to it. I I don't I don't know whether or not Jennifer Crumbly took her son shooting or not. We haven't heard any witnesses that have been able to testify to that yet. So maybe later we'll get back to you. You know, we'll get back to you. And apparently, for some reason that passes my understanding, I am not able to schedule another stream and just duplicate the stream I already have, which is frustrating me. But that's okay. We'll do it the hard way. Yeah. Eh. So what else do you have while I'm trying to schedule this afternoon sh afternoon's uh, video before I close the stream and, you know, redirect? Uh, video so we'll just copy this and then I'll just copy the description from earlier and put it here paste whoa okay it seems like the defense lawyer's first trial maybe I've seen better, but at least she did better. Is target practice illegal? No, but it might be relevant to her knowledge. It might be relevant as to her knowledge of her son's ability to shoot. It might be relevant of her son's ability to use the firearm. It speaks to her knowledge. The fact that she went with him, assuming it did, assuming she did, right, might speak to her knowledge of her son's ability to use the firearm familiarity with the firearm especially as we've sort of heard alluded to that apparently it was the son who was teaching her and knew more about the firearm than her so that would that would be relevant to her knowledge base about what she did know or didn't know so is, is it illegal to go no does it speak to her knowledge yeah po po possibly so it's relevant you know No, I didn't I didn't hear the answer that way. I didn't hear the answer that way. She was good at the Michigan Supreme Court? Okay, cool. Then she let her son manipulate her? I don't know if it's necessarily an issue of manipulation. I don't think that's fair. That a child knows more than a parent about some particular subject doesn't mean that the child is being manipulative. Just because I could teach my parents something doesn't mean I'm manipulating them. It just means I'm a just means I'm a teacher. So I'm not sure it's manipulative. Are you taking a lunch break? Yes, I absolutely am. I'm just scheduling the thing so that I can take a lunch break. So I'm behind the scenes trying to schedule the stream for this afternoon so that I can, you know, go go get lunch. I think I'm gonna get a submarine sandwich of some kind. And I'm just trying to figure out how to do that because I'm struggling right now. She's putting it all on James. Well, one would expect, yes, I would anticipate that she would put it all on James. Yes, that would be my expectation. She, is anyone charged with a straw purchase? No. No one, to the best of my knowledge, no one's been charged with a straw purchase. I'm not even sure legally it is a straw purchase. 
you know, I'd have to really go consult my law on that issue. I'm not sure legally it is a straw purchase. It is, yeah. I don't, I don't think it, I don't think technically it is a straw purchase if you buy a gun with an expectation that you yourself are going to buy, give it, give it as a gift in the future. I don't think that it qualifies as legally as a straw purchase. So if I buy a gun today with the expectation I'm going to make it as a gift later, I don't think that's quite the same thing as a straw purchase. The lines get tricky. It's been a while since I knew my firearms law. I used to know it better, but I don't think that's a straw firearm. I don't think that's a straw purchase. Distinctions matter sometimes, man. It can get a little bit fuzzy. All right, when are we back? 12, 12 o'clock? 12.05 Central? All right, so we're back at 12.05 Central time. All right, great. That's 1.05 Eastern time, so they're back at 1.10. Yeah, that makes sense. So we're back at 1.05, 12.05 Central. Okay, great. Please schedule the stream. Thank you, YouTube. Now I need to set up the redirect to send you there automatically. Yeah, I'm going to get food. I'm absolutely getting food. I think I'm going to go out and get some... Uh, Get a submarine sandwich. That sounds good right now. What am I trying to do right now? I'm trying to set up a redirect. All right, good. I've set up the redirect. Okay, so is there any last questions before I end the stream so I can go eat? Because I've got about 40 minutes to do it. No? Great. All right. So if you have any further questions, I'll pick them up in this afternoon stream. We've had a good morning stream. I'm looking forward to covering it this afternoon. And I do appreciate the 774 of you who are here. So just a friendly reminder, please hit the like button if you haven't already. It's free and it does help the algorithm. And if you would be so kind, have you consider hitting the join button for a mere 99 cents a month? I mean, it's like a third of a price of a cup of coffee. 99 cents for the less than a third of the price of one cup of coffee you can support me for an entire month by just hitting the beautiful beautiful join button and becoming a member of the channel you get your name in green you get a cool little icon by your name you get some emojis you get some members only content which tends to be me streaming and gaming and stuff that's fun and you otherwise get to have an, you get to help an uncivil be able to afford the summer and sandwich he'd like to have for lunch. So that's all, po I know, three cents a day. Three cents a day, man. You lose that in your co couch cushions. For, yeah, for example. So we, yeah. And also, of course, just a friendly reminder, for those of you who have Amazon Prime, you can subscribe, which is the paid option, on Amazon for free. So if you have Amazon Prime and you set up your Amazon Prime to be connected to Twitch, you can subscribe which gives me money, but doesn't cost you anything. You don't pay me, Jeff Bezos pays me. That's fun. So if you have Amazon Prime, you can go over to go over to twitch.tv. You can sign up for a Twitch account. It's just Uncivil Law on Twitch as well, same name. Go there, sync up your accounts, hit the subscribe button. You do have to renew it every month manually. So that's a bit of a, cha bit of a pain. So if you subscribe via Twitch, please remember to put a reminder on your calendar every month to renew that beautiful, beautiful subscription so that I can once again continue to eat. I appreciate that. I have not started packing. No, it's a one-bedroom apartment. No, I'm going to be able to pack it in two and a half days. It's, it's a one-bedroom. It's easy. You know, it's not it's not that big a deal. So no, I, I, I won't pack until like two days before the move. No must, no fuss. It's a one-bedroom. No problem. All right. I've been on civil law. Until later, my friends, I hope all is well. Cheers, my friends, and goodbye.